Okay, is this thing on? Hello, gentle and modern apes. I'm really glad to have you here today. We've got a very special presentation. And by presentation, I mean, I'm going to sit here and drink tea. I'm going to eat this apple. And we're going to go over some very wacky stuff that I have um, come into possession of, let us say. So we're on StreamYards. That means we're doing this live. Normally, I tend to do these coverages through OBS so I can make myself little. I'm like in the corner for coverage. But, ah, God, I just, I didn't want to edit this. I wanted this to be live because I want you to experience this in real time with me. We can interact in the comments and enjoy ourselves. Oh, boy. Okay, where to begin? So, as anyone who knows this channel well will know, the Standing for Truth channel and I have been a bit on the outs recently. And by recently, I mean the past couple of months. This is because I felt disrespected, essentially, by the lack of a two-way street with regard to the conversation that we're having on conventional science and the veracity thereof. Now, <laughs> let's begin with, with the inciting incident, if you will. I believe it was yesterday. Yesterday, I get this, uh, I get this ping on YouTube. And the ping is essentially like, you've got a compost from a uh, community post compost. I realize this sounds like compost, but community post uh, from Standing for Truth. And it is the latest attempt by Brother Raw Matt to differentiate the human uh, fossils and the ape fossils. Uh, Nonwithstanding, of course, the fact that Standing for Truth accepts that humans are indeed apes. Raw Matt does not though, which is why, um, I don't know, I wonder if that if that's cause for any tension uh, in, in that kind of relationship. Um, let's see, let's see who's hanging with us today, because we've we've got uh we've got some comments. We have 24 people watching. That's pretty sweet. We got speed. Oh, speed, you um you you moved the weather report. I will plug the weather report at the end of this. Please do go and enjoy the weather report at Speed of Sound of Gravity's channel. He does some excellent content over there roasting the brain trust and kind of associated uh, pals therein. Roof in the dot. Guts a gibbon. I'm glad you're doing a video on the subject. When I tuned into Stain of Truth's latest interview on the flood, his guest said that all eight fossils we find are considered our ancestors by the seculars. Yeah, that sounds about right. Standing for Truth's guests have been getting progressively more empty-headed as time has gone on. You've got David McQueen, the famous guy who, um, he thinks that there's human blood in all oil, <laughs> which is crazy to me uh, because that's such an easy thing to test. But also it's crazy because it just is an insane proposition from someone who claims he has any uh, authority with geology. Um, of course he doesn't, he's like an aviation engineer, but I mean, that's kind of, we're doing some serious bottom of the barrel scraping at this SFT channel. We've also seen the return of Kent Hovind over there, which again, not sure why he's having Kent on considering Kent's track record. Um, and we've also got like this weird Indiana Jones and dressed up like archeologist looking dude who to my knowledge has no actual education in the realm of paleontology, it's very funny. Um, but, you know, we're, we're, we're not talking about standing for truth today very much. Instead, we're mostly going to be talking about Raw Matt uh, and his latest crimes against conventional science. So allow me to, to pull this up in, in the background here, just because it's, it really is such a joy um, to, to be here and, and sharing this with you, uh, particularly because of how, if you'll pardon my French, batshit crazy things are getting on that front. And you're <laughs> you're going to um yeah you're 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 gonna you're either going to love this or it's going to uh, make you feel as I do, um, which is mostly nauseous. All right, this is called all right. This is just great. I I'm sorry. It, 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 as a fair warning, this is going to be a bit meaner than usual um, because and I told standing this in the comments. I'm not treating their efforts as good faith anymore. I think the channel is a grifty channel. And as such, any interactions here on out until we actually get answers to the questions that we've asked is going to be bathed in a comedic light. Of course, we're going to be examining the arguments because that's first and foremost what matters. But we are also going to be a little bit meaner. So I apologize if you're used to my uh, more amicable personality. I, I try to give people the benefit of the doubt. I really do. But to be fair, Everyone in the comments has been telling me that SFT is a grifter for much longer than I've been treating him like a grifter. Um, let's 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 check in with the comments before I share the screen, and we can dive into the uh, today's atrocities. 
let's see here over in the side chat. I do. I, I this is I always tell myself, why am I not live streaming enough? Josiah Hansen is in the chat. Josiah Hansen's significant other has designed an incredible shirt uh, that is, I believe it says Young Earth Creationism, the other flat earth. And I'm trying to actually uh, purchase it, but I'm having bank issues right now, which is uh, kind of funny. So Josiah, please, if I don't think you're wrenched, but let me wrench you, make you an admin, and then you can you can plug it in the chat. Um, let me adminize you. You have been promoted. <laughs> CRISPR is in the side chat too. CRISPR says they have benefited from plenty of tout already. They need no more. CRISPR, I have something that you're going to love today. You are actually, um, you were actually explicitly prodded by SFT in one of our recent conversations uh, via comment. So please stick around. I think you're going to get a real kick out of this email. I, I don't know if it's an email or like a DM that <laughs> Ron Matt got from Parsons, which is very funny to me. David Neff is here. Hi, David Neff. Vendalia is here. Hello, Vendalia. Uh, Christian Jensen, what is a grifter? A grifter is someone who is essentially making money off of being a bad faith actor. Um, they're not actually interested in the conversation. They're not actually interested in the discussion. Um, and, and to me, given my year plus time interacting with Stand for Truth, I think at the very least the channel is a grifty channel and I think that standing for truth is behaving as a grifter behaves, uh, which is which is as far as I'll, I'll say, yeah, Dapper, a grifter is like a con man. The ultimate grifter in young earth creationism would be Kent Hovind. Um, let's see, what else do we got? What does a mean Gutsy Gibbon look like in Delhi in 1998? Uh, like this, uh, except with a more furrowed brow. Yes, please do vote <laughs> for Matt for uh, DFOTY. That stands for uh, dump of the year. Um, our, our pal Dapper Dino made an excellent video who we're going to be visiting Dapper's content later in this in this video because it's uh he's made an excellent presentation for why Raw Matt should be taken like less seriously than I don't know like like a sixth grader giving a presentation in class. And we will be touching on that as well. We've got a lot to cover today and I'm mostly just chatting with everyone in the side chat instead of actually getting this done. Um, so let us let us move over to sharing the screen so that you can see what I am seeing and and suffer along with me. So we'll share my screen here. I don't like StreamYards, but you know, we're doing StreamYards because I'm inept when it comes to actually doing real OBS work. So this this is where it begins, folks. Now I I've been avoiding interacting with Standing for Truth because he's been frankly a his content has been a, a very large waste of my time. And I know because I watch it all just for you. I listen to it when I'm running. I've been doing excellent on my New Year's resolution in case anybody's been wondering. I'm killing it. <laughs> I'm killing it. Um, but running still sucks. I, the runner's high is a myth, I'm convinced. Uh, but, but this just, I couldn't resist. I had to interact with this because it absolutely blows my mind. The sheer dumbassery that was presented by Raw Matt here. Of course, Standing is peddling it, so he is complicit in the stupidity, but let, let us address this nevertheless. Standing for Truth says, icing on the cake after such an evolution dismantling presentation and discussion. I don't know what video that's referring to because I've been uh, do, engaging in self-care recently and that includes not exposing myself to the dangerous levels of dumb that comes from the guests that Standing has been having on recently. Evolutionists have pretended that identifying a human in the fossil record is just far too difficult in terms of differentiating between primates. To credit, he, to his credit, he's saying between primates because staying for truth, again, accepts that humans are indeed apes and thus are, you know, all the way up the list, caterines, haplorines, primates, etc. Um, <laughs> what are the major differences between the two? Well, look no further. You will find these similar features. You are then clearly able to delineate the two. Of course, somebody might occasionally find one or two characteristics on a place, but here we are, of course, talking about the overall consensus lining up. Uh, it doesn't work as delineating characteristics if it's violated frequently, and we're going to see how frequently that's violated later in, in, this, uh, in this hangout. We do not make the exception to the rule to overturn the rule. Pathology, disease, and deformity are very real things. We don't make the deformity or the pathology the main criteria. One out of place anomaly means nothing. More on this in today's much must watch interview. I'm assuming that this is the interview with like the Indiana Jones dude. So let's click and find out. Cause I actually, I, I never followed this link because I was so gobsmacked by the actual presentation. Oh, Joseph Hubbard. Yeah, that's going to be our boy. 
that's gonna be our our buddy limestone Ch yeah he, he standing has been real miffed on my comments on uh limestone and it's actually just I mean this kind of spurred me um into into being interested in making a video on precisely why this is problematic uh because i did the math i sat down and i the dreaded math. Yeah, this is the guy I'm talking about. Look at this hat. Look at this dude. Look at the top of his head. This guy's insane. Um, but that's not why we're here. Let us, uh, let us, oh, shite. Look at this. I accidentally X'd out of it. Wait, hold on. Hold on. We can, we can, uh, we can get back to it. Standing for truth. Show us the money. This is like the, one of the few times I've been desperately trying to get back to standing for truth. Here it is. Okay, yeah, there we go. There we go. We'll click back on it here. Debunking Gutsy Cuban's epic fill of a rebuttal. You gotta love the you gotta love the adjectives, you know? Um oh shoot, this actually isn't the one either. He just Stand for Truth composts like nobody I've ever seen. So it's actually very difficult to get to the specific dumb one that I'm talking about. Here it is, here it is. Okay, sorry guys. So this is why I don't live stuff a lot, because I'm always goofing. I'm always clowning, trying to get to where, where I want to be. So naturally, I see this, and I think to myself, damn, this is really dumb. And I point it out. I say, this didn't work as criteria the last time Ramat presented it, and it doesn't work now. And the problem is, because, as you hear, the difference between the parabolic palette in humans and the more U-shaped rectangular palette that we see in the chimpanzees today, first of all, is bridged by all of the hominin fossils. In fact, we see the parabolic palette appear as early as some of our australopithecines. Uh, I believe Afarensis is the first, but I think we actually even begin to see it in Anamensis, which is which is pretty wild. So parabolic palette uh, does not work unless these guys are willing to categorize the australopithecines as human. So let's keep that in mind as we move to the next one. The chin, we're going to be talking about chins a lot today. Um, you notice he points, he takes this little arrow and he points at the Neanderthal skull here and is like, look, see, here's a chin. Um, that counts as, as being human. You're going to have a lot of problems once you reach um, <laughs> Homo heidelbergensis and the like, but we are going to be discussing why Neanderthals don't have chins later, which again creates a new problem because we go from humans including australopithecines upward to with this new categorization humans just being anatomically modern then he says what about the alignment with the other toe the, the halix the big toe being in line with the others well if we're including halix alignment as the criteria we're back to including the australopithecines as humans because we see alignment as early as australopithecus afarensis and then he talks about the ribs this is very funny to me because when we look at the hominoids today um or hominids i, I suppose we should go with we actually see humans with 12 and orangutans with 12, but gorillas and chimps with 13. Um, so if we're going to include that, that's going to be very awkward as we sit in the homo genera with, uh, with the pongoids, which is kind of silly. So, so essentially, I, I note on this. I say, hey, this is really dumb, and here's why. And I list the reasons that I just expressed to you here. Um, we also talked about how brain case size, which is typically used to differentiate Homo nostalopithecus, uh, fails even in conventional anthropology because we see such a gap bridged between the likes of Homo habilis, Australopithecus sediba, uh, Homo rudolfensis, Homo gautengensis, and Homo erectus, which has this insane range of brain case size. Um, and so I say, so insanely enough, none of this works, but worse yet, they're repeats of what Ramat has already said. Because the funny thing about this list is a couple of months ago, I was in someone's side chat. I was probably being a masochist and hanging out in a uh, logical, plausible, probable, or our friend John Maddox's live chat. Um, because I hate myself and like to expose myself to that kind of, uh, well, you know what he is. And, um, and Ramat comes to me and he's like, hey, does the, do these work as criteria? And he essentially gives me this list with the exception that he also includes the reproductive bone or the baculum that's, that some primates have and some don't. Humans are one of the kinds that don't. So, you know, if you don't have a penis bone, don't feel bad. No human has one. <laughs> uh, but neither do many of the new world monkeys and, and other primates as well. So I said, look, this isn't going to work because, and I essentially listed the reasons I gave you here. And he was, you know, disappeared into the pail uh, as if to say, okay, I'll work on it. But clearly he did not because he just presented the same exact list here without 
the reproductive one without the baculum. Um, which is why I was like, this is like a, to be a cool kid from 2012. It's like an epic fail, right? Like this, I would classify as a, as a traditional epic fail. And, um, and Stanning gets mad. He gets real pissy about this. And he was like, that was desperate and not surprising. Well, I imagine it wasn't surprising because I've already presented this rebuttal before. You can't say you answered the question if you just repeated the first thing again, right? Like the way a conversation works is if I say, um, you know, A is not true. You've said A is true. I say A is not true because B. And then your response to that is A is true without addressing B. Well, that's not really a response now, is it? Um, so so this is very funny. He does the team dodgeball MVP. Uh, again, this translate this transports us back in time to actually before 2012. I believe Dodgeball the film came out in like 2008 or something like that, maybe even a little bit earlier. Then he goes, thanks for playing. And he gives us this link. Now, I'm going to tell you a little something about this link. This link here is going to take us to this page, which I hope you can see. This is a 32-page uh, rebuttal to me, attempt at a rebuttal to me. But the funny thing is, what you're looking at here is not what I originally received. What I originally received is actually, hold on, yeah, is down here. And I downloaded it because I suspected after I busted a gut laughing at how dumb it was, how utterly um, mind-melting this experience of reading this thing that, that Stanning peddled to me from where I'm at was, I suspected Stanning would get embarrassed and try to change it because it was so dumb or at the very least add to it. And so not surprisingly, that's what happened. As soon as I saw this, I downloaded it. And after Stanning and I went back and forth for a little bit over here on this, uh, on this deal, I hope you did get to see that um, on, on Word because I pulled it up. I don't know. Can you guys see Word? Let me know. I haven't looked at the chat in a minute, but I'm about to. We go back and forth for a little bit, and um, and then I, I let Standing know that I am going to be milking this piece of garbage for content. I can't resist. The siren song is too alluring to me. And um, and then I go back to check the, the link, and I notice that Ramat is live editing it. This is at about, like, midnight last night. I'm watching Chopped. I'm relaxing. And um, and I noticed Ramad is live editing it. Of course, he should be. He should be very embarrassed at what he put out. And we're about to go through why. Um, but I thought that you would find it very, you know, you'd be tickled by the idea that um, not only was this presented to me as the original was presented to me as a legitimate response, but after being pointed out how horrible it was, it was then added to. So we will be going over the original today. Standing, I understand that you said in my comment section, in my compost, my community post, I realize that that doesn't sound as good now that I say it out loud. In my community post, make sure to go over the updated version. No, we'll be going over the updated version tomorrow or perhaps the next day in another additional very juicy live stream where we cover not only that, but another, we'll, we'll be dipping our toes into some jeans and stuff as well. Um, but I'm going to be going over what you gave to me as a legitimate rebuttal. That's what you presented as what was supposed to be an acceptable response to my criticisms, which is why that's what we're going to be going over today. So let us uh, let us bask in that for a moment and check in with the live chat before we um, before we actually jump in. <laughs> jump in. We've got seventy four people watching. I'm I'm so glad you're all here. I I hope you don't find this uh, boring or anything. Or if you do, that's that's fine. Let me know in the comments if you find this boring. <laughs> but then just you know don't stay. Um, so what, what's what's the live chat up to here? Intrigued feline. It is like saying our loss of tail removes us from the phylum of chordates or something. Yes, it is very much like that. Um, SFT lives for, for praise. Yeah, he does. We're actually going to be touching on something, uh, a little clip that, that Evo grad um, or Rational Mind over on Jackson Wheat's channel said earlier that I think really encompasses kind of my thoughts on on team SFT, why they, you know, why they keep saying the same thing over and over and over again. Um, yeah, a roof for the dot. SFT did not answer me when I asked him how limestone forms and why it might be a bit longer. That yeah, mm -hmm. yeah, he's he's definitely not going to touch the limestone stuff. That I haven't even fleshed out. He hasn't seen the fleshed out limestone argument. The only thing he's seen is me arguing with Argotha, a guy who was over on John Maddox's channel as to why it's problematic. So he's trying to jump the gun here, but oh, the poor boy doesn't even have the full argument. Um, the button is back. Thank you, Ian Chen, for, for $5. Yes, the button is indeed back. Uh, Scott Do Scott Duke says, fear not furring of the brow. Sometimes he had, yeah, it is. It absolutely is. Um, 
What S education this says what SFTs and answering people shocked gambling, etc. Yeah, I know it's shocking. Rational mind, you're here. Rational mind. I think you will be, you need to stick around as well. You and CRISPR both need to stick around because you're going to find this absolutely shocking. This is going to floor you. But in fact, Ramat is repeating the same DNA barcoding claims that you BTFO'd in that video of yours on, on Jackson Wheat's channel, which I rewatched last night because I was like, I don't remember you know, precisely what, what his barcoding arguments were, but I actually, I hope you don't mind, I, I grabbed some of those slides for the conversation that we're going to have on the updated version. Um, El Spaghetto says, if you can make this a regular thing, you could call it the compost heap. I love it. I really do. Brenda's here as well. Uh, welcome, Brenda um, and El Spaghetto and Trevor is. I like how they prove evolution when they try to disprove it. Yes, it's very funny. And speaking of which, let's get into this. Let's let's get into this a little bit because I think um, I think the time is now. We've been going for 20 minutes and we haven't touched Raw Matt's actual um, document to me. It's a, it's a bit of a love letter, I would say. Uh, <laughs> that would require Raw Dummy to understand what DNA barcoding is and how to interpret the data. Yeah. That would require that, and that is simply far too much work. Um, Ramat, his brain, at least based off, if, if I, if you gave me this document and you said, what do you think the brain of the person who made this document looks like? I would say it looks like the DVD screensaver where the DVD thing is bonking along the corners, you know, and you're waiting for, for it to hit the corner perfectly and bounce backwards. And every time it hits the corner, Ramat can generate a thought, right? Um, and that's the degree we're dealing with here. You're about to see why, uh, especially if you've been a longtime follower of this channel, because you'll notice I've covered a lot of what Ramat is repeating. Um, it's it's going to be, yeah, Stuart Bell, uh, Stuart Ball, Koala Brains, very smooth. Yeah, head empty, no thoughts. That's that's what we're dealing with here. Um, so let's hop over. Let's let's do this screen share and, and really sink our teeth into it. You like that? That was from free uh, ASMR. Okay, can you guys see this? Can you see the uh, the Microsoft Word thing? I, I imagine you probably can, but if I hop over, it's gonna be like, it's oh, it says stop sharing. Okay, I think you can see this. I'm gonna give it a minute and hop over and check just to make sure that the Word thing is showing up. Someone tell me, what, could you see the, the, no, can't see too well. Could you see the, okay, yes, good, 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 cool. Let's hop back over. Okay. So this is titled Debunking Erica's Failure of a Comet. You have to appreciate that um, Standing for Truth and the gang are very keen on these um, explosive adjectives because their work can't speak for itself. Let's start with the Neanderthal chin, shall we, Ramat says. Then he goes... <laughs> absolutely perfectly in character instead of presenting sources he takes screen grabs you won't find a single real source here it's all tabs from like like pages that he's visited um like even this this isn't a clickable link you see what i mean this is like a it's like a pit. Oh, wait, then wait, this actually might be a clickable link let me rephrase that sorry ramat for un uh un very few clickable links. Um, and instead of actually quoting and properly sourcing, we get a lot of these screen grabs. So we begin with this screen grab that starts with, here's an evolutionary puzzle I have never thought about. Why do we have chins? That bony protuberance at the end of your jaw may be hidden by a beard or a fleshy throat, but it's still there. Essentially, this is talking about the, my first problem, which is that a chin, the presence of a chin, is what would differentiate humans from Neanderthals. One of the small things that would, and thus it cannot act as a means to differentiate human and ape specimens, hominins in the fossil record. Then he goes, he, he highlights this portion that says though this is a matter of dispute. I think you guys will be um, floored to find out that this first source comes from Evolution News, an intelligent design website. I know that that is going to be an absolute shocker, but let's, uh, that bony protuberance, you know what, I think you can just go evolution news, I think it's in my, uh, news, is it? On the order, oh, here it is, okay, cool, I thought it would be, because I've, I've looked through this before. We've got this lovely thing here, uh-oh, stinky. Taken from Evolution News. You're off to a real bad start there, Ramat. Because 
as any of you who know me um, and who know that I'm a master's student, I, I very much am keen on proper sourcing. And I'm very much keen on sourcing from the literature, the big capital L literature. That means we're sourcing from like legitimate journals and not pop sci articles that already in the name have a very heavy bias against the idea of natural selection. So I'm sure that's shocking to everybody, um, but trust me, we'll, we'll continue to get worse. Yeah, ASMR. Mm -hmm. Okay, cool. So we're going back. Boom. All right. Essentially, what we continue to get here is, that said, some Neanderthals appear to have developed more human-esque chins, blah, 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 a bunch of stuff highlighting weak chins, um, chins, 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 little to no protruding chin, basically just screen grabs of people saying, ah, actually, Neanderthals might have chins. Um, and he highlights this with, receding chin doesn't mean no chin, Eric. I know that's hard to grasp, but that's the reality. Boy, it's almost like there's a gradient there. And it's almost like a receding chin isn't the same thing as a chin. Hence, there is an adjective in front of chin. If it was a receding chin, but it was actually just a legitimate chin, they would just call it a chin, now wouldn't they? Um, but I've, I've decided to do a, a quick little deep dive because a couple of the sources that he provided were indeed legitimate. So this is a nice little slideshow that I've, I've souped up uh, from the past. Uh, I used to use this back in the day when I would get coffee with my creationist friend. Um, but let's discuss some of the anatomical features very briefly uh, that, that separate just based off of the skull alone, humans from Neanderthals. This is not even considering the genetic work that's been done, the fact that humans and Neanderthals are definitively two separate species. 99.7% um, is usually the degree that's given. But the morphology, which is what I'm keen on and what you can see is also very important. So Neanderthals have a large brow and a receding forehead, which is very different from the characteristic globular shape of the human skull. They have this large knobby occipital bun, totally unique to the species. Humans can have little buns back there, but they're nothing to the degree of what we see in Neanderthals. And this is because they have a huge occipital lobe. They would have been excellent athletes. They have a large brow ridge that just dwarfs the humans in comparison. They're overall just much larger. Their brain case is 1500 to 1700, dwarfing the humans. They have huge round sockets with an angle that is characteristic of their species. Uh, the chin, of course, is very obvious here. We've got this bony protuberance heading outward here and very, very slight uh, protuberance here. I guess you would call it that, but like we're about to see what, that, what the literature actually says about Neanderthal chins. Um, but then there's also the retromolar gap, which I, I see covered very little. And that's just essentially this idea uh, that humans have a gap at the very back with our molars here. Boom. I don't know if you can see this. Yeah, there's a retromolar gap right back here. And uh, that's characteristic of our species and, and not any of the other hominins. But interestingly enough, this was a study that was done eh, somewhat recently. I believe it was yeah, 2013. Eh, not, not super recent, but I still like it. I think it's a good study. Where they essentially looked at the mesori or sorry, mesina jaw. Now the mesina jaw is unique. We see three clusters here, right? Three distinct clusters. This cluster over to the left is Homo sapiens jaws. But specifically, we're looking at the chin, the, the bony protuberance part of the chin. Uh, this middle cluster is Neanderthals, and this cluster over to the right is Homo heidelbergensis. Now, what you'll notice is that the Neanderthal cluster and the human cluster don't overlap, save the Mazina jaw, um, and the heidelbergensis doesn't overlap at all. And this is because Neanderthals don't have chins, certainly not to the degree that humans have. The Mazina jaw is an anomaly, and if you'll remember, standing doesn't like to make the anomaly the rule. But that being said, in real conventional science, we do like to consider the anomalies. And one of the explanations that's being given for this Mazina jaw, um, and I believe some, some nuclear genetic work is being done on it, is whether or not inbreeding occurred, because that's the current hypothesis, is that it's found in an area that would have been conducive to Neanderthal human breeding, Neanderthal and sapiens inbreeding. Um, and so the idea is that, or interbreeding, I suppose you would say. So the idea is that it's possible that we've got this mixing of traits and that this isn't actually a Neanderthal that we're looking at, but rather a hybrid. And that's why um, you're, you're getting this jaw. The point that I'm bringing up here is that Neanderthals cluster entirely separately from humans. They are distinct to the degree of chin that they have. But the fun part about this is we can consult the literature. What do you guys think? Who likes consulting the literature? Let's see what the chat says. I'm still eating. Do more ASMR. No, Brenda. 
zoom in more. Wait, sorry, what did what's intrigued feeling say? Zoom in a bit more. The text is a bit readable. Oh, I'm so sorry. I let me try to do that. I wonder if I can. Um, is this zooming? No. Get add-ons. Okay, here. Now, hope this is helpful. There we go. The study of the Mazina jaw shows that the chin region is similar to that of other late Neanderthals, which display a much more modern morphology with an incipient mental trigone. In our view, this change in morphology among late Neanderthals supports the hypothesis of anatomical change in late Neanderthals and the hypothesis of a certain degree of interbreeding with um, anatomically modern humans that, as the dating shows, were already present in European territory. Boy, it sure is cool what the literature can tell you. So we're not done with this, though. Um, fortunately, oh, God, how am I going to zoom back out? 100%? Oh, no. Oh, no, 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 no. How am I going to do this, guys? Zoom out? Okay, I've screwed it up. And thank you, an intrigued feline. You've screwed us. Just kidding. It's okay. We'll work it out. Um, but yes, let's continue. The enduring puzzle of the human chin. Um, because again, what we're trying to figure out here is, can the chin be used as a way to distinguish the apes from the humans in the fossil record. And if you'll recall, Standing for Truth in the Gang considers the hom of the hominins, right? All of our, ooh, our hominins. They consider all of genus Homo to be human and all of the Australopithecines to be their own thing, except for Australopithecus sediba, which is very late Australopithecine and starts to inherit some of these, or starts to, sorry, display some of these Homo traits, and Homo habilis, Homo rudolfensis, and Homo gautengensis, all three of which display very basal traits. And the reason why they don't include those is because they think they're fake species. And no, they haven't given any reason to think that. And no, they haven't responded to my over six hours of video explaining why they're not because of articulation, matching and articular joint surfaces, and just the fact that we've got a whole lot of them. So please, standing. I've watched all your videos, and I know you haven't covered it. And I really know you haven't because you had the opportunity to reiterate the reasons, and Ramat failed in doing so. But we'll cover that a bit later. Let's continue to talk about the chin. Mm. The enduring puzzle of the human chin. We're just going to look at the abstract in brief because it summarizes what our problem is here. And by our problem, I mean, yes, the, the problem of conventional science with categorizing what is and what isn't chin. Although modern humans are considered to be morphologically distinct from other living primates because of our large brains, dexterous hands, and bipedal gait, all of these features are found among the extinct hominins. The chin, however, appears to be a uniquely modern human trait. Probably because of the chin's exclusivity, many evolutionary scenarios have been proposed to explain its origins. To date, researchers have developed an adaptive hypothesis relating to chins, relating chins to speech, mastication, and sexual selection. So other seeds of structural artifact tangentially related to the complex processes involving evolutionary retraction of the midfacial skeleton. Consensus has remained elusive, partially because hypotheses purporting to explain how this feature developed uniquely in modern humans are all fraught with theoretical and or empirical shortcomings. I would agree with that. Here we review a century's worth of chin hypotheses and discuss further research avenues that may provide greater insight into this human peculiarity. Peculiarity. Man, I almost made it through that whole abstract without tripping on my speech. So Pimpush, we're going to see a lot of Pimpush. Pimpush is the chin guy, okay? The world of anthropology is small, which means that you've got experts who all they do is one thing. Pimpush is the chin guy. So here he's talking about how, yes, chins, in the extent that we see them in humans, which is to say... This morphologically distinct jetting out right here, it's a human, it's an anatomically human thing, anatomically modern human thing, even though we do see it a bit in archaic, almost sapiens, it's mostly anatomically modern human to the degree that we see it. And I tracked down another one of Ramat's sources. This is actually where I found this graph from. His second source that he uh, uses discusses Neanderthals with human-esque chins. Again, what we're seeing is potentially some some sexual selection or, or selection for better speech and mastication patterns. But the funny thing is, is as you continue to track down raw mat sources, we continue to find out more and more that they are simply screen grabs from Popsi articles. In fact, I don't think he quotes from a single actual legitimate source, um, which is funny um, and depressing. So this is the other, this is the other uh, nice paper I wanted to talk about. This is titled, Oblique Symphysial Angle is Associated with an Evolutionary Rate Shift in the Early Hominin Clade. 
The reason this is important is because it starts to talk about how aspects of the anatomically modern human chin appear as early as the Australopithecines. Boy, that's problematic, isn't it? Because it means that if you're using the aspects of any kind of aspect of the chin, whether it's receding or not, if you're using that as your means by which to categorize humans, well, you're going to have to move the Australopithecines into the human category as well. So the symphysial angle is going to be additionally problematic. Um, and then we have selection played a role in the evolution of the human chin. Chins, which are unique to humans, have generated considerable debate concerning their evolutionary origins, yet a consensus has remained elusive. So what have we seen here from the actual literature that spans quite a few years, but the most recent of which is from 2018, and I believe it's this one? I believe the symphysial angle was, yeah, 2018, the most recent of which is 2018. What have we found? Well, we found that clipping some different pop sci articles is not the same thing as the actual literature and what the literature says. Because colloquially, a receding chin can be considered to be a weak chin. A receding chin, you, you could propose that that is indeed a weak chin. But in the realm of what is empirical and measurable, what is and is not a chin has a very specific set of criteria. Um, and we can read those if, if you'd like, but you can find them in any of the papers that I listed. And hopefully I'm going to go back and put slide those into the, into the um, sources, into the description of the video a bit later. But Rama continues on talking about tiny chins, um, talking about how all of these pop sci articles are talking about how Neanderthals have weak chins, which is another way of saying receding chins. And as we just discussed, receding chins are not the same thing as an anatomically modern human chin. Um, and if you want to include them as an anatomically modern human chin, because they're on the degree of what a chin is, then you also have to include the Australopithecines in it. Um, according to Erica, these, hu these are not humans, as they lack modern day average chins. If she were to find them in the fossil record, she would classify them as intermediates without question. Raw mat, you absolute moron. Having a weak chin? is not the same thing as lacking the bony protuberance underneath that. If you'll remember, in the conversation about beards covering them up or, or fleshy aspects of the, of the throat covering up what the chin actually is, you still have this identifiable morphologic characteristic of a jetting out chin. It's not the strength of the jaw. It's does this protuberance exist or does it not? That is what morphologically characterizes a human chin. These guys have that. Yes, it is in fact obscured by what is essentially a, a fat neck, I guess, or a big tongue. But boy, what do you suppose this is right here? Right? What do you suppose this is right here? These guys still have chins. They don't have a chin in the colloquial sense of having a chin, a strong jaw. But this shows me how little you know about morphology and what morphology means and what categorizes empirical measures within it. Her comment on the parabolic jaw shape, that's funny. It's not a parabolic jaw shape, it's a parabolic palate because it's mirrored on the top and the bottom. Uh, is more than funny, especially since she lists the human skull as evidence regarding the shape. It's like talking to a five-year-old and how they just plug their ears and say, nuh -uh. can you just... Is it palpable, the irony here, uh, the hypocrisy? Here is the reality. I know it's hard to swallow, but different people groups have different chin sizes, and we can see a clear weak chin in Australian Aboriginal people, including large brow size. These are <laughs> genetic phenotypic traits. How many times do we have to say it? All three of these have chins. There's the bony protuberance there. There is it. There it is right there. And there it is right here. Now we're going to get into some really awkward, like, race stuff. Um, I wasn't a big fan of it. Um, I understand what he's going for, but it reads like a, what Walker say? My buddy Walker described it as like a 1920s bioanth textbook, which is a little bit weird. But before we do that, I'm going to I'm gonna check in with the, uh, with the comments and see what everyone's thinking. Yeah, they do need beards. Yeah, that's a given. He's straw manning you there, by the way, just so you realize. Oh, well, 100%. Yeah, Ra Ramad is, um, he's a real piece of work. Um, is SFT a proponent of race realism? I don't know. I'm not going to comment on that. I've got no comment on that whatsoever. Vendelia 1998 says, if you click the very right button on the bottom of your screen, share the screen with the full screen, you'll vanish. Oh, okay, yeah, I don't want to do that. 
Uh, try control scroll. Yeah, sure, in Tree Feeling, I'll give that a try. Okay, it says, uh, you have to realize that if you've got something shown on the native result, okay, this is more, you guys are giving me tech advice. I appreciate the tech advice. Um, and true, yeah, he is, yeah, of course he's strong. Maybe, but I don't know. Yeah, I don't know. Is that, no, Leo Phileas, I don't know if he's a race realist. I'm not touching that. Again, I'm, that's not, um, that's not something that I'm gonna, that I'm really gonna get into. Um, but hey, whatever. I'm, I'm, mm, mm, I really hope he's not. Um, cool. So let's get back into it. Let's get back into this screen sharing nonsense. Ah. <laughs> the same you can see with ancient Egyptians, as they were famous for inbreeding. If you look at the archaeological bus, a particular feature stands out. A longer skull with a weak chin. No, a weak jaw, maybe. A weak chin in the colloquial sense. But do you see this right here? This jetting out? Neanderthals lack that. Um, so again, th there's this problem with understanding a gradient that we see with these people um, that, that really, you know, irritates me because it's such a freaking waste of my time. And he talks about inbreeding. Um, then he shows a bunch of Aboriginal people to show that they've got large brow ridges. Uh, again, when you compare this, the, the, the skulls side by side, you can get empirical measurements. The brows that we see in ad Aboriginal peoples today are dwarfed by what we saw in Neanderthals. It's not even on the same level, okay? So it, you can say that it's the similar thing, right? Like, of course, there's, there's um, a range in what humans can display. But this is not the same kind of situation. Um, the same thing is true for the chin. You can't, <laughs> you cannot argue that Neanderthals have a chin and that, say, Homo heidelbergensis doesn't or Homo habilis doesn't uh, because it's, it's on that same gradient. Large brow ridges and weak chins as visible throughout the indigenous is as, I think he means is visible throughout the indigenous people of Australia, as you can see, exactly how we've explained to her again and again. It's still wrong. Like, this is what blows my mind about these people. Like, you can sit down and you can explain why they're incorrect. They'll repeat the same thing again and again and again and do so with confidence and pride. Um, it's, it's a very rough situation. She pretends we do not answer her, but in reality, she doesn't like that we have an answer and that it's so easily explained. No, Ramat, engaging with you makes it so that I have to start at such a low level of understanding that working our way up takes a significant amount of time. Um, and I realize it may have been difficult for you to understand the videos that I covered, the actual morphology of the likes of Ashwapitka Sidiba and Tom Habilis, um, and, and why indeed they are problematic for you, as, as you will repeat that they aren't later down this list. Uh, but, you know, it, I don't know. Like you're 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 not displaying an excellent understanding of the uh, the concept, the the biological foundational concept that you're trying to overturn here. Uh, she wants to tell us these subhuman Neanderthal and Denisovans had weak chins and large brows are the perfect example of them being intermediates. When we've clearly shown that modern people lie have these same features. No, they don't. As I just explained, these traits are genetic and phenotypic. That has nothing to do with anything. They are common characteristics of inbreeding, and Neanderthal children don't have brow ridges they form later. There's a lot to unpack here. There's a lot to unpack here. First of all, let's let's start at the bottom and move up. Neanderthal children don't have brow ridges. Baby chimps don't either. You guys want to see something kind of cool? Hold on just a sec. Infant chimp skull. Yeah. Boy. Boy, man, that... It doesn't look like there are any brow ridges there, huh? Hmm. Well, I guess we'll just have to include humans in with, with like, the rest of the, the, or, sorry, chimpanzees in with the human clade, according to Ramad, if we're using brow ridge status at infancy as a characteristic. Uh, but, you know, that's, that's, I've always really liked this picture, by the way. This, this, the idea of retained neoteny being a large factor in why human skulls look the way that they do is something that, that's been shown to be very compelling. This is very interesting as well. The um, neoteny, state of neoteny for pan, so chimps and humans, uh, and then the intermediate of a chimp being compared, a juvenile, essentially the chimp being compared with an adult human. But we never reach that full stage of, of maturity, essentially. Our, our skulls stay neonatic, which is cool. And, you know, I don't know. I, I would call that based, but maybe maybe that's nerdy. So, yeah, so this is um, stupid. Common characteristics of inbreeding. Um, no, certainly not to the degree that you would require in order to include Neanderthals as just a human species. No, that doesn't work. 
these traits are genetic and phenotypic. All traits are genetic and phenotypic. Um, that's like listing a definition isn't something that is uh, an argument or compelling. Modern people alive have these exact same features. No, they don't. They don't even fall within the same range as I showed you with an actual piece of literature comparing chins of uh, archaic humans with the chins of Neanderthals. Um, two distinct clusters with overlapping in the case of inbreeding. Boy, that's that's interbreeding, my mistake. Um, very interesting. So, yeah, we're like O for a zillion here. As always, Erica exhibits her master dodgeball skills, master class. I wonder if we'll ever get answers to our arguments pertaining to the Y chromosome, mitochondrial DNA, genetics related predictions, confirmed predictions, including Y chromosome confirmed predictions, arguments demolishing Erica's lack of rebuttal to genetic degradations, arguments demolishing Guts at Gibbons' misrepresentation of Nathaniel Jensen, and uh, arguments demolishing naturalistic worldview, origin of life, arguments dismantling overused junk DNA talking points. She's had months and has failed miserably. We aren't holding our breath. So I, I talked about this to standing, like in the in the comments section. This is that he says A, I say A can't be true because B, and then he says A is still true without actually addressing B. Uh, therein lies many of the problems. The Y chromosome, like the problem with that, you know, again, I, I've already discussed this with him, uh, but the fact remains that my comments on all of these topics haven't been changed in the videos because they haven't been challenged. So with regard to the Y chromosome, why is the chimpanzee, why is the Y, why is the Y chromosome of the chimpanzee to so, so much more divergent than that seen in the humans? Because they have a much higher mutation rate. They've experienced incredibly um, robust, I don't know, maybe robust, um, heavy sexual selection because they are a highly polygamous species. In fact, the Y chromosome of genus Pan, so all of the different subspecies of, of Pan troglodytes, as well as Pan paniscus, the bonobos, shows more diversity within the Y chromosome than like the other hominoids, which is very interesting. It tells us that the reason the chimp Y chromosome is so divergent and is indeed the most divergent of the hominoids, it isn't the human that's the odd man out there, it's the chimp, is because of, of how essentially they structure themselves socially and how those social and sexual implications have played on their genetics. Mitochondrial DNA, um, listen, this along with the genes and stuff is, I don't, it makes my mouth taste like battery acid when I try to discuss it because I've seen nothing with regards to, to justifying Jensen's work. His complete miscarriage of representation for next generation sequencing, utilization of Centos et al., his usage of Parsons, despite the fact that Parsons is the only odd man out with regard to all of the sequencing that was done during that period of time, roughly 1998. Genetics-related predictions, no, there aren't any genetics-related predictions. Again, predictions, this is, this is funny that they include these two as separate things. Genetics-related predictions and confirmed predictions. This is the only one that matters. Are there any confirmed predictions? Including Y chromosome confirmed predictions. Yeah, Stanning has yet to um, kind of explore why Jensen's artificial flattening of a massive population growth, uh, like a demography graph, demographics graph, for humans, it's got all these nice little bumps in it where humans populate, human populations have surged and then died down, and surged and died down. Nathaniel Jameson's predictions work if you flatten that into a single exponential curve, um, which is called data fraud, by the way. Um, can't, can't do that, or I'm sorry, that the phenomenon of doing that is called data fraud and Nathaniel Jensen may or may not be guilty of that. I will leave that up to the audience uh, to, to discover. You can see my, I'm probably done with creationist video where CRISPR and I chat about this. I'm sure CRISPR is going bonkers in the chat right now talking about how dumb Jensen is and how bad Parsons is. And you should be because they, both of those things are um, dumb and silly, but I've discussed them elsewhere as ad nauseum and yet to receive any like rebuttal to B, right? <laughs> A is true. A isn't true because B, A is true again. Like that just, that's the logic. Head empty, no thoughts logic we're dealing with here. Arguments demolishing the lack of rebuttal to genetic degradation. Standing yet again showed to me in the comment section last night that in order to get genetic entropy to work, you have to take absolute fitness as your like definition of fitness, which is um, a worthless definition. It's not applicable to anything at all. Fitness is the ability, like your your um, reproductive fitness. It, it, that's kind of what fitness is, right? It's how many offspring can you produce? How adept are you at reproducing? How can you progenate your genes? Um, and they just want to change that definition to make genetic entropy work. 
Um, I don't care how you justify it. That's still what you're doing. Uh, and the justification doesn't work anyways. But people um, way better than me at this subject have done. You can see uh, Creation Myths channel. Dan in the, in the chat goes over that ad nauseum, which is lovely. Um, and standing refuses to cover anything in regards to that uh, either. Arguments demolishing origin of life. I don't give two shits about abiogenesis. It's fun to talk about, but I don't really care. It has nothing to do with evolution. It has nothing to do with the age of the earth. It has nothing to do with the fact that myself, standing for truth, Ram, and everyone watching this, are indeed apes uh, and our species evolved from more archaic apes. And arguments dismantling the overused junk DNA talking points. Sorry, even the ENCODE researchers, many of them who worked on that project that was like 80% function, have copped to the fact that no, their definition of functionality is not actually applicable to, to anything uh, in, in reality. She's had months and has failed miserably. We aren't holding your breath. Um, if you're trying to bait me into responding, congratulations. You, you successfully did so. Uh, producing something as asinine as this document did, in fact, bring me to the table again. Uh, but only to make fun of you. So, you know, I don't know how bad. Then he shows, he plugs, like, he sends like two pages plugging his own channel. Um, and funny enough, I've watched the majority of these videos. I went through and clicked through all of them. And I was like, hey, I've, I've watched this. Hey, I've watched this. Hey, I've seen this. Hey, I listened to that while I was um, like dying running. Um, and no, I can tell you that the reason I haven't responded to them is because they're just repeating the same points over and over again. She ignores the genetic data that demonstrates strongly humans and the great apes do not share common ancestry. Wrong. So, so, so wrong. So the, the basic concept of why humans are apes and why we evolved from other apes uh, is because we share 98.8% of coding base pairs with chimpanzees. Um, and that gradient continues as you move into the more basal primates. So you, I think rhesus macaques is like 92%. Gorillas is slightly less than chimps. Orangs is slightly less than gorillas. Um, and you move down that line. Now, the problem is these guys lack an ability to actually create a separation of where genetics as the cur or rather DNA as the currency of heritability stops. So a paternity test is cool with them. It works that you can use a paternity test on a bunch of dudes to find out which one is your parent using essentially what is a, a dumbed down version of a full genomic comparison. Take a segment, line it up, see who you match with the most. But for whatever reason, and they can't present an actual empirical justification for this, at some point, that stops working, okay? They're cool with it using, using that to say humans and Neanderthals are related. They'll take it up through Denisovans. I imagine if we had Homo erectus DNA, they'd take it that far as well. But for whatever reason, it stops at an arbitrary point, and they can't tell you where that point is. That was one of my big questions, and very humorously, the answer was barcode, um, DNA barcoding, which we will cover um, tomorrow. I believe we're, we'll do that tomorrow because it's just so funny. Or we might cover it today. I don't know. We'll see how I'm feeling. Um, then he talks about the Fox P2 gene, um, like SNPs and like coding RNAs, whatever. Um, Eric ignores and dog is so much data and evidence it would require a thousand page book to point it out i'm sure you've written about a thousand pages worth of like garbage that's been published on like amazon self-publishing i bought one of their books um and i'm not gonna buy another one yeah it's it was a waste of money um short of the content that i've kind of leached out of it anyways he continues to talk about <laughs> look at this we see nothing in the chimpanzees that even comes close to human spirituality and behaviors a level of sophistication orders of magnitude than anything larger or some magnitude larger than anything seen in chimpanzees um that's not how speciation works and that's not how genetics and taxonomy work either or phylogenetics for that matter i realize a lot of that is crossover um so the I hope you're getting a taste for the flavor of stupid that we're dealing with here. It's it's just throwing as much to the wall to try and send confident in your assertions to see what sticks. And as I said to standing in the comment section last night, um, I'm not going to just say the same responses to your repeated genetics arguments. They don't work. I explained why they don't. And until you tell me why my explanations for why they don't work are bad or faulty, um, the ball is in your court. Uh, the FOXP2 gene mentioning that is really interesting. Um, the FOXP2 gene is indeed something that's special to humans, um, and there are a bunch of genes that are special to humans. That's why we aren't chimps. We're a separate species, but we are indeed apes. We have all the criteria to be an ape. Um, we're in a different genera. I don't understand why that's not enough for these people, but we'll cover that in more depth later because he includes that in the updated version. <sighs> oh boy, the homo habilis stuff. Mm. Before we touch on this, 
I'm gonna see what the comments are saying. I'm sure I lost a lot of viewers in that section because it was boring, but oh no, I gained viewers. Cool. Oh, hello, welcome everybody. Let's see here. Okay, I know. I'm sorry. There's probably like a thing, a uh, uh, really cool uh, Inception deal. Anything cool in the chat? Looks like y'all are just chilling. Big chilling. Yeah, I am an apologist. I would say that. <laughs> Foppish <laughs> uh, dilettante. I would say that I'm an apologist. I like that. I'm gonna... Uh, might might steal that. Simp for chimp. True, TD. We do simp for chimps. You mean like Otangelo? Yes, I do. Um, thank you, Leo Phileas. Yeah. Okay, cool. Leo Phileas. Does Gutsy Gibbon not know about the YouTube studio? Don't condescend to me, Leo Phileas. I'm stupid with technology. My tech understanding is like... I was going to say it's on the level of, like, raw maps understanding of anything with regard to phylogeny, but it's not that bad. If it was that bad, I would be, like, um, the equivalent would be, like, being the Unabomber, where I'm, like, living out in the woods using no technology, because I'm that much of, um, of an, an inept kind of dingus with regard to that. Okay, let's let's continue. Let us continue along this journey together. There are 98 people watching. Thank you so much for being here, everybody, as we dunk over and over again on uh, one of the laziest creationist of shit that I've ever seen in my life. Um, and uh, like I said, I am going to be mm, mean because now we're getting into the homohabolus stuff. Free, free ASMR again. And this is the stuff that's bad because... Mm, there's even less of an excuse because of just how much work I've put into covering this specific hominin, as well as Australopithecus sediba. Mm. Raw map. Excuse me, apple eating. He says, Homo habilis? Question mark? Really? A hodgepodge of mixed species is good evidence still. It's almost like you want to believe that lie. Oh, right. Oh, that's right. Your actual career and future depends on it. Never mind. No matter how many times I tell these people that I am in primatology, the study of extant primates, they can't get it through their abnormally thick lunkhead skulls that I am not a biological anthropologist. My future, as someone who studies extant primates and their ecology, has very little to do with biological anthropology. I can make it have that to have to do with that if I want. Um, I could specialize in that kind of area. That's that's the beauty of primatology as a very flexible discipline. But that's not what I do. I, these people can't get it. Just because I like human evolution doesn't mean that I am a biological anthropologist. I, I, and I say this like at the beginning of every debate that I do. So, you know, this is what it concerns me, right? Because to me, What's actually going on is we've got like this this thick soup of white and gray matter sloshing around in Ramat's skull um, a, a, that is incapable of actually um, holding thoughts and, and memories of things that he's read and heard. Because I've said this so many times and I don't understand how no one seems to remember that, no, I, <laughs> I am not dependent on evolution. Evolution could be um, completely d overturned tomorrow, right? Debunked. I, Raw Matt will finally publish his manuscript and, and really just blow the whole conspiracy wide open. Um, and I would still have a very robust future in primatology because primates exist and do primate things. <laughs> and it's important to know what they are and how they do the things that they do, partially because of the implications for human medicine, because even guys like Sal, who don't think humans are related to chimpanzees, understands that we're really, really similar. Um, but also just because conservation is cool and, and like monkey, you know, we like monkey. It's the same reason why we study tigers and other cool animals. So, you know, I, I really like this whole conspiracy thing. Erica saying we failed to debunk isn't even something we need to debunk because the experts already have. So, of course, we do not need to do it. We can just show they say, just show they say, I don't just incomprehensible, and let you decide. So if you'll recall, I spent over six hours covering, I spent over six hours covering the nature of Homo habilis and the nature of Australopithecus sediba and covering, going through meticulously, all of the presented 
um, quote mines brought to the table by Ramat from, from very specifically the likes of Bernard Wood, um, and explaining why what Ramat was saying they said was not what they said, saying that the, the Homo habilis um, sort, of, sort of species is very roughly defined is true. It doesn't make those fossils disappear. It doesn't make what they show as transitional forms disappear. The reason why they are considered to be very muddy, the reason why Homo habilis is a muddied species is because, let's hop over here real quick, back over to our cool and based PowerPoint, and the reason is because we have approximately three different species that fall into what could potentially be Homo habilis because they show such a very slow, steady gradient. That's the problem. We're seeing change so slowly, we don't know, and we got such a great representation of this portion of the fossil record, we don't know if they should be one very variable species or three separate species because they track through you know, morphologic change over geologic time. Um, that's why the... That's why the group is muddied. Early Homo is muddied because we've got this gradient. Like, I don't know how someone was just saying in the chat that I'm triggered. I am triggered. I'm very irritated. Um, yes, yeah, standing for, oh, good. Oh, standing is in the chat. Oh, isn't that just lovely? Standing is in the chat. Leo, does Guts a given not? Yeah, no, yeah, you already read that, Leo. Uh, creationist, can you direct people? Yes, I'm going to be plugging the hell out of your chat later tonight. Um, Ren, well, thank you for so much content. You're welcome. I'm happy to do it. Uh, Kyle Saltzman, creationism hurts my brain. I don't know how you put yourself through it. I'm a masochist. That's how. Um, undercooked Ma uncooked Matthew is intentionally ignorant. Yes. Sandy for Truth says, we spent the first 10 minutes of Joseph's interview going over his qualifications for his multiple degrees in relevant fields, paleobiology, zoology, paleobiology. Yet Erica says he has none. Um, yeah. We looked into this guy. I, I'm very, I'm very surprised to hear you saying, to hear you say that. Um, we'll, we'll touch on that a bit more in a, in a sec. Heathen Wizard says, man, you guys seem to have profound dislike for this raw mat guy. Tell us how you really feel, Erica. Yeah, I don't like him. I think he's dishonest. I know he's an academic fraud, but we're about to, we'll touch on that in a sec too. Um, an intrigued feeling, some change. Okay. Yeah. You can see some changes with Homo erectus over the 1 million year time span that they roughly existed. Yeah, true. Rayward, do you have degrees in paleobiology, geology, and zoology? Yeah, TD, stay for truth. Are you going to send that math? Yeah, TD Lane has been asking Standing for Truth, who is in the side chat, for some math regarding um, the, the I believe it was birds, their their speciation and extinction rates for quite some time. Standing says he has the math, but he won't he won't cop up and provide it, which is classic. Creation is Standing for Truth. A little birdie told me you were telling people I'm canceling creationist channels. Yeah. And you look in the description of the presentation Q&A, very telling that Erica misrepresents, misrepresents so harshly. Yeah. I don't know about that standing. Maybe we should dig into it. Maybe we should find out. Just since since standing is so uh, confidently asserting that this guy is, has the relevant credentials, maybe we should look into it. Let's let's check it out. Standing for Truth YouTube channel. Let's check it out since we're right here. We'll see. Okay, let's see here. Yeah, here's our Indiana Jones boy. Joseph Hubbard. Joseph Hubbard, creationist. If memory serves, this guy like goes and does. Yeah, he's with John McKay. Oh my God, he's with John McKay. Are you serious? Oh, standing. He's a university student studying geology and paleontology. Okay, standing. Yeah, he's got the relevant degrees. Leads field trips for creation research and assists at meetings. He talks on dinosaurs. His talks on dinosaurs are very popular with school students. Yeah, standing. Cool. He has the relevant degrees. He's a student. Unless that's out of date. Let's team. Let's see. Let's see what his. Uh, let's see if our boys got the re if he achieved the relevant credentials. Click on picture for full bio. Let's find out. And I'll apologize if I'm wrong. He's complete. He is completing his degree in paleobiology, a qualification in zoology, and has extent an extensive experience in archaeology. Man, standing, get out of here! Stop lying in my in my side chat. If you're gonna say he's got relevant degrees in all of these fields, then you're saying he has relevant.
degrees in these fields. He's a student, okay? Man, that's so lame, dude. This is, this is, yeah, this is why I'm not interacting with you guys anymore. That's like the lamest thing I've ever seen in my life. Yeah, it's, you, you know, maybe you should get canceled for being dishonest. 99 viewers. Yeah, thank you, guys. Please like, comment, and subscribe. Yeah, thank you. And uh, as Bennett says, sorry, that does not make him incompetent, but claiming he has degrees makes him dishonest. Yes, that is dishonest. I agree. What degree? He's still a student. Yes, Danny. Man, get out of here, dude. That's so dishonest. That's not, f oh, God. Yeah, what a liar. Why did they, you, you get caught red-handed like this. Why would you do this to yourself? But let's continue with Raw Matt. Let's continue with Raw. C comes in here, says, I'm a liar for misrepresenting this guy. I go and look it up. He doesn't have a single degree completed yet. You've got to be freaking kidding me, dude. That's That's so insane to me. That's, oh God, that's so embarrassing. Erica's desperate attempt to hold on to the wastebasket that is known as Habilis is laughable. Ian Tattersall, by the way, we emailed Ian Tattersall, who's commented on the nature of Homo Habilis and also commented on their use of his paper as obscene. So Ian Tattersall is not a fan of Team Standing for Truth. Uh, calls it a wastebasket tax on little more than a convenient recipient for motley assortment of hominin fossils. Yes, like I just discussed, because we don't know if Rudolfensis, Gatingensis, and Habilis are one single species known as Habilis or several different species. The bones still exist and their traits are measurable. And he believes that one more hominid species is more than one hominid species is represented. Okay, so then he would be keen on the idea that there are three or perhaps two. Erica has not even come close to refuting or addressing the series on the fossil record and low quality versus high quality science. Um, that's because that's a frankly bullshit made up terminology by Robert Stadler. Robert Stadler? Stadler, the guy who wrote the, the, the he's creationist who wrote a book on this. And very similar to what I see creationists doing a lot on the Standing for Truth channel is just making up definitions and then fitting things he doesn't like into those categories. He's not a conventional or, uh, yeah, conventional scientist. He's not doing legitimate work. He's writing books instead of submitting to peer reviewers. Um, I'm coming after you guys today, man. I'm irritated. And I, ooh, I can't wait to ignore all of the subsequent videos that don't answer my questions. Um, on the fossil record. Now, I've covered everything you guys have done on the fossil record worth covering. And you've not gone through any of my videos on it. She ignores it. Way to answer. Um, genetics is what's inherited from sperm and egg. Yeah, we'll, we'll be talking about the genetics tomorrow. This is why people like Erica ignore the genetic data and focus on low quality, uh, con low confidence and low quality science. Again, this is creationist terminology. It's like saying uh, historical science. We've covered numerous overwhelming lines of evidence for genetics demonstrating that humans are not related to chimpanzees. Nope, but we'll be covering that soon too. I cannot wait to discuss barcoding. Um, here's the real, oh, sorry. We see an abrupt appearance with unique differences in humans. Nope, we see contemporaneity with multiple different hominins, but the slow emergence of the traits that humans have that are also retained in sister species, um, potentially due to an early emergence and potentially due to similar selection. Erectus had very human-like qualities and unique differences not seen in previous hominins. Yes, that's true. And it is from its first and this is from its first appearance. No. Nope. You see a gradient. There's very archaic Homo erectus that is almost indistinguishable from the likes of Homo rudolfensis. In my fossil record series, I have shown just how much conflict, differences in opinion, and contradiction there is in the field of paleoanthropology and human evolution. Um you can just substitute that for science. There's a lot of like arguments in science. That's what the field is about. Finding the truth and different people have different opinions. But there's one thing that everyone agrees on who's a, a conventional scientist in the realm of biology. Um, and that's that humans are primates and humans are haplorines and humans are hominoids. Um, and we evolved from previous other hominoids. And when I say I mean, of course, hyperbolic. I'm sure there are some individuals that, that disagree with that, but they're all creationists. Boy, isn't it curious that we don't have anybody who, who finds the, the data that creationists present compelling who aren't religiously inclined towards it? Isn't that strange? Okay, let's see. There's no consensus in, there is no consensus in portions of the fairy tale once believed to be true or overturned all the time. Um, yeah, portions are. That's the nature of science. Here's the reality of Homo habilis, a smorgasbord of random miscellaneous fossil finds all tossed into the same bin. Nope. When fossil skeletons are found a bit more complete, they're entirely ape in every way. Nope. Covered, covered that 
ad nauseum. I went through contested bones. Mm, let me show you this. Thank you guys for finding this uh, funny and enjoyable. And I'm, we're going to be going on longer than I thought because standing decided to show up and be dishonest in the chat. Um, so, sorry. Blame standing for truth that this is uh, lasting longer than it should. God, I can't believe you did that. That's actually insane to me. Okay. I believe it is this one. And we're not going to be listening to it. All I'm looking for is a frame. Please don't show ads. I know I'm, I know I'm, uh, making you guys watch ads, but I really hope it doesn't make me watch an ad on my own video. And hold it, hold it. Where's my Microsoft Paint thing that I was, yeah, here it is. Yeah, so I went through Sanford and Rook, the creationists who claim that when we find them articulated, that they're like, you know, Rob is claiming when we find them articulated, they're all ape in every way. First of all, Sanford and Rook disagree. Second of all, I went through each and every portion of this, of uh, these two finds, um, the Moapa hominins, one and two. And no, no, none of that is the case. There, There is a gradient present, not just in each aspect of the morphology, like the lower limbs or the jaw or the crania or the upper limbs or the rib cage or the pelvis, but aspects of the pelvis and aspects of the jaw are mosaic in nature. So for instance, if this is the jaw here, let's say we're dealing with one of the Moapa hominins, the, the ramus of the jaw, right? may show something that's very basal, but the body of the jaw may show something that's very derived. This is the nature of transitional forms. The transitional pieces are themselves transitional in nature and show different aspects depending on which part of them we're measuring. But of course, Ramat has never actually read a, a paleontology paper considering um, what, what he's just displayed here in this, um, in this document. So let us let us continue uh, onward. <laughs> numerous numerous pale experts. He means paleo experts, but they're still calling it that, which is funny in and of itself. Agree that habilis is nothing more than a mix of bones consisting of multiple species. No one says this. No one says that Homo habilis is a mix of bones containing multiple species. Some say that certain specimens are one species and certain specimens are another. But again, what they're talking about is, sorry, this. They're talking about the fact that we have the likes of Rudolfensis, Gautengensis, and Habilis to contend with. Stop being dishonest, Ramat. Read some papers. Learn the terminology. You're not going to overturn this. Not if you can't describe what morphology is not if you can't understand what transitional species are this is this is like wild to me this is like someone who doesn't understand newtonian mechanics trying to overturn relativity that's what we're dealing with here this is bonkers to me um but yeah this is something else that's very interesting that, that displays the problem that i'm talking about here this is homo habilis here and this is homo rudolfensis there's distinct differences in the morphology from from the face shape the fact that we've already got a nasal bone showing up in homo rudolfensis that isn't present to the degree uh that, that we see it in in um rudolfensis and habilis the shape of the skull is unique the the angles of the orbits the brow ridge the teeth um the, the size of the palate um you know, this is this is absurd to me that, that he's managing to misunderstand this on such a pathologic level. But let's continue. Then, oh, yeah, this is really funny. Paleontologist Bernard Wood and professor of biological anthropologist, professor of biological anthropologist C. Loring Brace from the University of Michigan, working that Habilis was an invalid taxon to Herman Homo Habilis was pure ape. No, they did not determine that. Stop lying in your own presentation. I went over both of those quotes in my Homo habilis video, Ramat. This is insane. I, I don't misrepresent you guys like this, at least not intentionally. You know, okay, let's see. It's another fraud push today as one of their best examples of the mis missing link intermediaries. Feel free to email them, the experts, anytime. Would well, you suppose that they've like emailed them and asked them what they think? Because you would think that if they did and their, their position was validated, that that would be spread all over uh, Standing for Truth's community. But it's not. Isn't that curious? The chief science writer for Nature, Henry G., declared hominid evolution as mysterious as ever. Um, yeah, there are aspects that are. Once again, evolutionary theorists taught us one thing, drop common sense at the door. There's so much quote mining here and so much, 
I don't know if it's intentional or if he's genuinely just so uninformed um, that that he doesn't know what statements like this mean in the grander scale of of like human evolution. This would be like saying, yeah, the the, gene, the human genome is as mysterious as ever, and then saying, yeah, toss genetics out the door, my guy. What a worthless field. It's so mysterious. So I guess you know, it's, and it's always changing. So I guess we just you know guess it's invalid. <laughs> If that's not dramatic enough, note the following confession by evolutionary zealot recently published on the Talk Origins Archive documented prominent hominid fossils. The bold emphasis is added by this writer. Um, I hope this is wrong, Matt, not you standing. Again, I, but I'm really, oof, yeah, you're you're not. There's a little consensus on what the family tree, um, on what our family tree in hen signs in Hekines? I don't know what that is. Maybe maybe I'm in the idiot now. Yeah, then he lists three paranthropines are not ancestral to us. They never have been considered to be ancestral to us. The paranthropines have never been proposed to be ancestral to humans. They've always been a sister group, to my knowledge. I mean, and I looked into this last time we talked about it, being a side branch that left no descendants. Whether Habilis is descended from Africanus or Afarensis, both of them or neither of them is a matter of debate. Yes, true. I I've never on this channel proposed that we can make a March of Progress style lineage. It's possible that none of the known Australopithecines is our answer, is our ancestor. That's also true. But the what, what we do know is because Australopithecus Afarensis, because Australopithecines depict uh, a, a almost a perfect intermediate of the gradient between Sahelanthropus chinensis and anatomically modern humans, we know that our ancestor probably looked a lot like Australopithecus afarensis if it wasn't directly that species. The discoverers of Ramidus and uh, sorry, Artipithecus ramidus and uh, Australopithecus anamensis are so recent, it is hard to say what effect they'll have on current theories. This is also from the Talk Origins archive, which was like last updated in 2006 or something like that. It's generally accepted that Homo erectus is descended from Homo habilis, or at least, no, that's not generally accepted actually, which shows how old Talk Origins is. Uh, but the relationship between erectus sapiens and Neanderthals is still unclear. Yes, yes, all of this is true. The, the, these guys think that the fact that the field is being researched, you think we've got it all figured out? You think we've got all of science figured out? I mean, the 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 um, double standard treating human evolution like this and then looking at the realm of genetics or medicine and claiming that, yeah, they've still got things figured out, but they're trying, they're working on it, right? When so much of the picture is clear, it's like having a jigsaw puzzle with a couple of pieces missing. You don't, you can't be for sure, right, what the entire picture looks like, but you can tell the general trend. And that's the important thing. That's the applicable thing. That's what makes the predictions that are then shown to be correct. <laughs> Uh, then they said Homo habilis evolved in Homo erectus, and they recanted that remark when they discovered they lived at the same time. No, they didn't recant it. Like, guys, this is not, this is not, I already covered this in both of my videos. Contemporaneity is, like, the whole last portion of one of my videos. Like, these guys, they don't care. They, they don't care about having a discussion. And I'm, I'm, this document has convinced me of that. Whatever good faith hope that I had kind of floating in the corner, gone. It, it eviscerated thanks to raw mat's ineptitude. This entire paragraph is a concession to the utter confused ignorance of human origins from the Darwinian perspective. For anyone that needs more evidence against Habilis, watch these two videos. Oops. I really want to find out when these were published. Because I suspect we're going to see a discrepancy. Who is this? Oh, holy shit, are you serious? I did this entire video with Godless Engineer. I covered this entire thing. You can find it on his channel. I covered this whole video piece by piece. Already. Where's the log here, you guys? Oh, man. See, Standing accused me of getting mad yesterday in the chat, and last night I was not mad. I was very... I was drinking my tea, I was eating sits, and I was watching Chopped, and life was good. Um, but now, I'm a little mad, I gotta admit. Genesis Impact, this is just, God, this is the same group, this is just Genesis Apologetics again. What, what is wrong with you guys? This is, I covered this, I, I, I was capable of covering this, I'm a student. What? It's no wonder, man, that, that scientists, legitimate scientists, don't waste their time with this stuff. I'm glad they put it on students. 
Okay, let's see what the chat's doing. The chat's probably telling me I'm being mean. I am being mean. Okay, well, yeah, standing for truth is calling uh, Christian Miss a socialist. Yeah, that's okay. Standing, whatever, dude. I I let I genuinely can't believe that you okayed this. You okayed Raw Matt's like document here. That's the part that blows my mind. Sorry, I've got a dog growling in the background. You'll have to you'll have to forgive me. Yeah, Rayward. Science changes equals bad. Raw Matt's want science to never change. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, if, if you got, you know what, normally I'm saying stuff like don't dunk on SFT in the side chat, but he's being, yeah, standing for oof is right right now. Yeah. Let's see. CRISPR Cas, everything with the possible exception of BS. Yeah. Yep. Mm-hmm. Cool. Talking about, I'm sure that's discussing uh, that dude that we just covered, Joseph, what's his name? SFT, if you briefly worked it with anything you'd have a de that you have a degree in. You are an expert. Yeah, true. Yeah. If that's the case, then I'm an expert in like the most random. I, I may as well be a veterinarian. I worked as a veterinary assistant for about a year. So I guess I'm a vet. And I guess I have expertise in that. LOL. Standing's molding so hard in the chat. Creation Mr. your obviously desperate loser who reaches out to those we interview in order to sabotage the interview. That makes you unworthy to talk. So please just block me. Standing, if you don't like Creation Mr., just block him. What are you, you worried people are going to call you a big baby? I already think you're being a big baby, so. Let's see. Yeah, everyone's just dunking on standing. Yeah, if you say paleo expert, I automatically assume you have no idea what you're talking about. Thank you, Dapper Dino. That's That reminds me. We're going to take a quick break from, from what we're working on here to dunk on raw mats. Um, academic fraud. Wouldn't you guys think that that's a fun idea? Kyle Saltzman, if you gave this document to any biology professor, they would fail you on the spot. No, they'd expel you. <laughs> they, they, they should expel you if you gave this uh, to them on the spot. Hi, Erica. Have you seen G-Man's latest video? No, uh, G-Man isn't really on my radar very much. Um, not really for any particular reason. I think G-Man's okay. G-Man's been engaging a lot more honestly than Standing for Truth has, that's for sure. Um, but yeah, he had a guy on the other day who was like, eh, he seemed, there were some... There's some sketchy stuff going on. Yeah, Genesis Apologetics is F tier. Dapper Dino. Yeah. Okay, so let's take a moment. Let's take a moment and hop over to the Dapper Dinosaur channel, speaking of which. Let's see. The Dapper Dinosaur. Dapper is a friend of the channel. We love Dapper. And Dapper took the time and energy to explain why Raw Matt, the uh, writer of this document, is a huge academic fraud, which is great. Um, and he also nominated him for uh, <laughs> Dunk of the Year, which is very funny to me. Um, and you should definitely vote on that. I don't know. I, I voted, but I don't know if it's still going on. Here it is. Academic fraud defined. Um, this this is a video that I'm going to plug in the co or in the description. And I want you guys to go check it out uh, because it, it details precisely why we know that ac or that Ramat is an academic fraud or, or sorry, tried to commit academic fraud, um, which automatically makes him not worth interacting with. Uh, but for those of you who may not be in the know, Ramat tried to submit a paper to um, PLOS Biology. PLOS biology. I don't know, which, however you say it. Some, CRISPR, correct me in the chat, or someone correct me in the chat. Is it PLOS or PLOS? I think it's PLOS. Um, yeah, he tried to submit a paper um, and then was going around, like, showing the paper with the with the PLOS watermark that he added um, as if it were published by PLOS, right? Like, this is, this is like, stage one academic fraud. Uh, and I believe, I think he's taken it down, but boy... I still have the copy, so reach out if you'd like to see it. Um, please, go check out Dapper Dinosaur. Subscribe to Dapper Dinosaur's channel. And while you're at it, um, while I am going to... I was waiting till the end to plug this, but you're going to also want to sub to Creation Myths um, because Creation... Okay. Dan, sorry. It's not popping up right out. Here it is. You're going to also want to go sub to Creation Myths because Creation Myths is uh, having a beautiful. I already know the, some of the details, but I'm going to be showing up for sure. Uh, he's got an upcoming live stream talking about Nathaniel Jensen, who is like Team SFT's linchpin guy. Like he's the guy that that single um, splintered post holding up the entire tent. And um, there's going to be some some serious, 
some serious breaking of that poll this evening. Um, I really want you guys to show up to this chat. You're going to really have a blast. Um, and I'm sure they'll take questions, which is going to be great. Standing, show up to the chat. Defend your defend your guy. This is going to be, uh, you know when it is. You know what's going on. Let's continue. Let's continue with where I'm at, though. Because I've used enough of your time already. Canines. Erica says, say Helanthropus chinensis did have canines, but they were reduced. Doesn't matter. It's not a human. They These are monkeys with shorter tails than others. Does not... There are monkeys with shorter tails than others. Does that mean they are more ape? No. It, yes, but there are cutoffs, right? Barbary macaques, right? The, these are these are a type of macaque that lives in Morocco. Um, I believe it's Macacus sylvanus, sylvestris? I think it's sylvanus. Don't quote me on that. Um, but Barbary macaques have highly reduced tails, like very, very, very reduced. It's not a single trait that makes them either just a, a, a circopithic, uh, circopithicid or a, a hominoid, right? Because if it was just based off of the tails, then Barbary macaques would fall into that group. But for one, we're dealing with phylogenetics and we've sequenced the majority of the genome for, for um, Barbary macaques. And we know that they nest with all of the other macaques and not with the apes. But also it's the fact that Roma doesn't appreciate that it is suites of characteristics that determine where you fall depending on which, which um, categorization we're looking at. Um, the fact that you get more specific as you go down is important to consider, of course. Um, but it's not just the canines that make, say, Helanthropus chidensis the likely root of, of the uh, hominin family tree. It's the, the reduced canines in combination with the bipedal adaptions that we see in it. Uh, and we're going to be talking about that in just a moment as well. No, once again, Erica misses the bigger picture. No, raw mat. This is like this... I don't even know how to describe this would be like taking a single aspect of Newtonian physics, like one equation and, um, and saying that taking that in account with other equations is missing the bigger picture, right? Like this, this doesn't mesh as a concept. It's not my fault that Ramat doesn't know how phylogeny works and how species are considered, right? And, and how um, groups are essentially settled upon. That's not on me. Okay, that's on him for being so highly uneducated that um, my blood pressure is through the roof. Chidensis has already been proven to be a gorilla species. The only ones holding on anymore are evolutionists like Eric. I mean, come on, really? Come on, really? Look at the thing. Even an untrained eye, it's nothing remotely matching the criteria put forth for Homo sapien. No forehead, no nose bone, small brain case. Like... Just let that marinate. Just let that sentence marinate. <laughs> the root of the tree doesn't look like anything it look anything similar to the end of the tree. Yes, that's how we know evolution occurred because it has many of the basal traits or sorry, many of the uh, root derived traits that we start to see um, what's the word I'm looking for uh, exaggerated in later hominins and we're we're about to explore that as well. But first, Let's consider the fact that I also made a whole video on this because it turns out um, the recent idea, what he's showing here, this idea that uh, the fossil find of the century, this is Pop's eye, of course, but the idea that I think it was Mac, yeah, Machiarelli et al., this paleoanthropologist, came out with a femur, a piece of a femur, a, a midsection of the femur. So it's uh, part of the uh, diaphysis of the femur. And essentially they, they analyzed the diaphysis, the, this chunk, and they were like, it doesn't look like whoever owned this chunk is bipedal. Now this chunk has been associated with say Helanthropus chinensis. So naturally I wanted to reach out to some paleoanthropologists that I know to see what they think. And I'll share those thoughts with you momentarily. But first I made a very long video, 12-ish minute video, uh, analyzing the two perspectives on this femur because a uh, guy at all, a guy who's a guy who's a, a Sahelanthropus chidensis dude. He studies a lot of early hominins, early proposed hominins and Miocene apes. And he took not just the diaphysis of, diaphysis of the femur, but he took that in tandem with the other traits that we have and that we know of for Sahelanthropus chidensis, the other aspects that make it bipedal. Because Machiarelli et al., the ones who looked at that femur, did not take anything into account other than the diaphysis of the femur. They looked at it in isolation, which is totally justifiable. That's cool. They did great work. I, I think their paper's awesome. That being said, not taking into account the rest of Sahelanthropus chidensis becomes highly problematic for them. So let us let us uh, look at some cool pictures uh, because I know um, Ramat likes pictures. 
most babies do. And let's consider the likes of Sahelanthus So here's the skull of Sahelanthus uh, It's approximately six to seven million years ago, depending on, on kind of what you're looking at. Sahelanthus had a 300 to 400 cc brain, so around modern chimps, essentially. But the interesting thing about Sahelanthus chidensis is until this femur came out, the entirety, the entire basis of Sahelanthus chidensis being bipedal came from the skull. And finding the femur doesn't change that. Finding the femur does not change the aspects of the skull, and I'm about to show you what I mean. So Sahelanthus chidensis has a femoral angle, like a, uh, sorry, a foramen magnum angle and position that necessitates a biped, okay? Um, and the angle plus the position is, has been shown to be an excellent, very accurate means by which to predict locomotion style. It's those two in tandem, not just the position and not just the angle, but the two together. Um, so for those of you who may not remember, the foramen magnum is the hole at the base of the skull where the spinal cord exits. Um, the more underneath it, the more directly underneath the skull the foramen magnum is, the more likely it is that you're dealing with a biped because it's obviously way more efficient to walk with the weight held directly underneath you um, if, if you are indeed a biped. And that would have the head on top and everything coming out below instead of the foramen magnum being back here and everything jetting out behind like you see in a chimpanzee. So as you can see from this, down here is pentroglodytes. These are our chimpanzees, right? I believe this is a male and a female, um, but it might be, no, I think it's a male and a female or just a, a, an adult and a juvenile judging on the canines. Um, but you see a very distinct angle here that's acute. You see this acute angle, right? You see a very obtuse angle when you're looking at Homo sapiens. And you see something that's obtuse for Sahelanthropus chidensis too. Now, the interesting thing is, is it's acute again for Australopithecus africanus. So therein lies a partial question, what's going on here? But looking at the rest of the postcranius suggests that one, we see variety in Australopithecus africanus, but also that it may have required some of these kind of pseudo arboreal habits. They weren't super efficient bipeds to, to say the least. Um, but this is the most telling picture. This is a chimp to the far left. This is a modern human. And this is Sahelanthropus chidensis. And the foramen magnum is intermediate. Boy, is that a shocker. Um, so, so the work done on this femur, first of all, according to the people that I've talked to, the vibe in the bioanthrop biological anthropology community appears to be that no one really seems to think that this is by any means for sure a Sahelanthropus femur. That's why it took so long to get it analyzed because there was a huge disagreement on whether or not it should be treated as if it were Sahelanthropus chidensis. It falls within the range of, of being close enough to the skull. That's absolutely true. Um, but, but according to the folks that do this for a living, no one is 100% certain that, that these two should be associated. There's not that articulation. There's not that um, joint articular surface that you can actually look at because it's the epiphysis of a femur, um, or sorry, a diaphysis of a femur and in the skull, right? Those things don't really go very well together. Um, but, but the vibe seems to be from that I got very loosely from a couple of anthropologists that I asked that no one is really leaning towards this femur being associated with the skull. Even if it was, though, that femur, which already isn't definitively going to, to support something that isn't at least habitually bipedal, because bonobos are habitually bipedal, right? They are, sorry, um, yeah, habitually bipedal to a very small degree, but habitually bipedal nonetheless. Um, and it doesn't make these, these bipedal traits for, for the skull go away. And the interesting thing is, if you're going to evolve bipedality from a quadruped, the first thing that's going to have to change is going to be the angle of the skull. Because you can't be having that foramen magnum at the back here, and then when you stand up, your head's like this all the time. You're constantly craning your neck. It's much easier to be awkward on two legs when you do go on two legs than it is to be looking at the sky all the time when you make the attempt. What use is being an efficient biped if you can't see in front of you? So those two things are very important to consider. Uh, but also let us let us look for a moment um, at the difference between, I don't know if I have it here. I think I can probably pull it up. Say Helanthropus chadensis canine size. They're much smaller than a chimps. They're already reducing quite a bit. 
We've got this picture, but this is the one we already saw. I think you can see it a bit here. Um, this is Sehalanthropus chinensis, and this is your chimpanzee. We, we already looked at this, of course, but I, I don't think we're going to get a better picture of them side by side. Um, that being said, the first thing that disappears isn't actually the height. This is because, by the way, my thesis is on canine dimorphism, canine, um, canine tooth height sexual dimorphism between males and females of extant primates. And the first thing to disappear when you lose dimorphism is the breadth, not the height. So what we see here is a disappearance in breadth already, reducing canines. Um, but the interesting thing is, uh, <laughs> Raw Matt goes on to talk about Artipithecus ramidus. And um, here's Artipithecus ramidus right here. And Artipithecus ramidus, not only this is ramidus, is pelvis compared to pantroglodytes. Of course, it maps much more with Homo sapiens um, and afarensis, shocker. But also the canine teeth are much, are heavily reduced in, in Artipithecus ramidus when compared to pantroglodytes. Again, shocker, but why is anyone surprised that Ramat is getting all this stuff wrong? It's certainly not me. Um, so the bottom line is Ramat claims that he watched my video um, somewhere in here. Erica's video is so bad trying to save this one. It's her favorite. I've never once said that Sehalanthropus chidensis is my favorite hominin. In fact, if you watch this channel, you'll know that Artipithecus ramidus is my favorite hominin. And I've said that a lot. I really want the skull for Artipithecus ramidus, but it's like $400 and I can't afford it. Um, she's totally upset with this new paper that discovered the new femur and found it was evidence that Sehalanthropus was not bipedal. It's an old femur. It was found in 2001. Um, so not new, fe not new femur. Um, she went on to try to prove this expert Machiarelli wrong. I guess he must be. He only has 211 publications. Okay, if we're doing it on publications, let's see how many Guy et al. has who disagrees with Machiarelli and thinks to say how the Pischidensis was bipedal. Guy et al. Say how the Pischidensis 2020. We'll, we'll just do this since we like to do these journeys together um, and bust in real time. I think it would be enjoy Franck Guy. Let's see. Franck Guy Anthropology. Mm -hmm. I imagine what Google Scholar? Maybe? Oh no. Oh my god, this is all I don't even know what I think. Dapper, what language is this? Someone tell me the language. Because I can't tell. I don't do the language stuff. Is this one in English? Yes, this one is in English. Citations. How many? How many find how many publications he's got? First of all, I don't think Guy or I don't think Machiarelli has that many publications. I think that's his citation number. Let's see here. Maybe, wait, is chat, ch chat might be telling me what to do here. Yeah, sorry, Tiktaalik. Yeah, I don't use dark mode. I know. It's French? Okay, an intrigued feline. Sorry. My bad. <laughs> Rayward. Maybe SFT is doing all this for money and isn't actually stupid. I'm gonna let that hang in the air. I don't know. Y'all, uh, you guys tell me what you think. Rayward says, just use Team SFT methodology of looking at it and calling it a gorilla without any study. Yeah, you gotta love the eyeball method that creationists support. Um, it's very funny to me that, like, it's so selective, right? Like, one minute raw mat will be like, just look at it. It looks like a total gorilla. No one would, a well, if I go, we put up this in front of a five-year-old, and a five-year-old would tell you that, uh, which, which one is the odd man out. Um, clearly, you know, <laughs> that's my, my, it's, oh my god, it's just the Kent, I don't even have the energy for the Kent, for the Kent stuff. Um, but yeah, they're, they're very happy eyeballing it when it doesn't suit them, and then, ooh, boy, will they cart out the experts the second they think they can use their authority on something. That is just the beauty, the beauty of the hypocrisy. Um, experts only matter when they prove my position. Let's see. Oh, an intrigued feline. Add me on Twitter. I can send you a picture of the Chidensis teeth. Oh, Dapper Dino. Nah, he's dumb and doing this for the money. Oh, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Dapper, for that. I appreciate it. Yeah. The whole group of us who are very, uh, who have given SFT the benefit of the doubt and engaged civilly with him for quite some time are getting pretty fed up with the blatant, more and more blatant dishonesty coming out of that group. It's like, 
standing for truth can interact with me and be the nicest guy ever. And he's like that a lot, but it's very suspicious when all of a sudden, you know, he, he turns into like this super shady guy. The second it comes down to explaining his point of view and, and how he can support it, which is very, yeah, very interesting. Um, we'll, we'll continue though. Uh, an intrigued feline. I don't really want to pull up my Twitter on stream. Um, but I am happy to, I am happy to do that at another juncture. Tweeted at, tweeted it publicly at the moment. Okay. Let's see. I guess we can just do it anyways. Because I do want to see those teeth. And an, an intrigued feeling is awesome at that. So let's see. Oh boy. I have a premiere. I'm sorry, speed. We'll pull down that for a moment. I don't see... I don't see anything in Intrigued Feline. Oh, yeah, here we go. Oh, beautiful. Yep. Yeah. So the interesting thing about this, too, is that if you know anything about pen troglodytes teeth, um, like I said earlier, they're very broad. They're, they've got this massive, like, width to them, a, a circumference. And um, typically in, in hominid dentition, when you're looking at dentition, you can look at height. Height can... I like height. I think height is a great means by which to to assess functionality and actually look at um, kind of how how the how the organism uses those canines, whether it's more for display or what have you, um, uh, or fighting, for instance, or perhaps whether it, you know it supports a monogamous or polygamous lifestyle, whatever. But the breadth is also important. That um, uh, buccolingual and mesiodistal right? The, the side, the length and width of the tooth is also really important and is used a lot. So I thank you for this and intrigued feline. I do appreciate it. Um, TP seeker. Well, guts it given saying for truth did say in the chat, but I don't want any more of this immature bickering and unprofitable war. Let's deal with the data. So he admits to grifting IMO. Um, yeah, he said that a lot. He'll go back and forth on that, which is the weird thing. Vindelia, what was your final straw? Oh God. I've had a couple of final straws. I don't know. I, I, I have a final straw and then I start giving someone the benefit of the doubt again. Um, and I start, you know, I'll have a good interaction with SFT. I'll be like, well, maybe he isn't so bad. Um, and then he'll like put this miscarriage in front of me and I'll be like, okay, <laughs> how can I keep forgetting? Like uh, maybe my head is the empty head. Sunflower, having a GF is more important than having an education. True King. Let's see. Um, CRISPR Cass, bachelor, uh, Let's see. Yeah, Bachelor of Science from where? Yeah, good, good question. Christian Myths, that was SFT agreeing to come on and cross-examine me for an hour. Any questions? He has now agreed publicly. Cool. Awesome. So so let us all appreciate that Stand for Truth has it has willingly accepted to go on Creation Myths and, and cross-examine Dan um, on whatever he pleases. I think that's awesome. You're not really taking all that serious. You're kind of the low-hanging fruit of Team Dodgeball. No offense. I don't know, Standing for Truth. I think you guys have been like sufficiently roasted by Dapper. I think it's actually, um, I think the the not covering Dapper stuff is pretty telling. He's pretty, uh, he's pretty thorough. Um, let's see. We've been going on for like eons and eons and eons. Let us continue. So I hope I've made my case. Um, I hope I've made my point that Sahelanthropus chinensis, the reason that it was originally assessed to be bipedal had to do with the the um, characteristics of the crania. So the location of the frame magnum uh, and then the reduction of the canine teeth was indicative of, of hominins because all hominins have that reduction of the canine teeth um, for whatever reason. There, there, I have my ideas, but we'll, we'll discuss them at a, at a later date. So yeah, frame and magnum, that was a biggie. That was a biggie with uh, Salanthropus chidensis. And that's why there is no consensus on whether or not Salanthropus chidensis was uh, bipedal or not. Um, but I've talked to a handful of anthropologists and while they think Machiarelli's work is great, again, they don't think it belongs to Salanthropus chidensis. And the, the idea is that comments are going to come out on that later, but we'll see. Um, I think that even if we're just assessing the current literature, um, the preprint for Guy et al, <clears throat> excuse me, for Guy et al, where he comes out and assesses the, the species as a whole, is more than sufficient to say that no, Machiarelli have not done anything other than to show that the diaphysis of this single femur isn't indicative of a biped, um, but the skull is, which is strange. LOL. In her last video, Erica says it kind of matches the human female's femur. Look for yourself. Say Helanthropus on the far left and Chimp on the far right. It clearly matches primates, even with an untrained eye. Ramat, you are a primate. Humans are primates. Um, 
And no one to date has shown me any reason as to why humans aren't primates. Um, and boy, uh, boy, howdy, have they tried. That's why Standing for Truth just accept it. Human ape. This is the, um, let's see, this is the picture right here. This is the, the um, TM-266. I know it's TM-266, but I think it's TM-266. This is the femur. Um, and my point is that it matches the human female decently. Um, it's more of this ovoid shape almost, but what it lacks is this dip, this perfect dip shape that you see. Because you've got like this, you see this protuberance here. I don't think you would call it a protuberance, but it's just like a raised level. It doesn't show that slope that the that the panins show, right? Um, in fact, doesn't it look a little, oh, I don't know, intermediate to you guys? Tell me in the comments. <laughs> this this is why I called this a tantrum. No, it doesn't, Erica. This is why you love your low confidence science conjecture. Um, cry, see, cry harder, Ramat. <laughs> but then you also think you know more than a real scientist in the field on the subject that has 211 publications while you have none. Um, yeah, I don't have any. I'm hoping to be published by the end of the year. Um, I've been told that my analysis is quite good. Um, and I'm very hopeful to get published. I'm thinking about trying for International Journal of Primatology. But again, I I don't think that you want to play this game, Ra Matt. If you want to go with the game of of appealing to the experts, again, I think Guy et al. Or sorry, Guy, uh, Frank Guy has more. Does anyone in the chat know? Staying for Junior. Yeah, true. Yeah, entry fine. Yeah, he doesn't use any data. Um, I kind of gave up on that, didn't I? I think that's an important publications maybe let's see here okay so 210 publications for guy maki uh rally anthropology publications <laughs> i like that 135 plus million publications that's like this is something that like i feel like uh raw matt would look at and be like yeah check me let's see though I'm trying to find, because I don't think 211. I think, my inkling is that Raw Matt is, um, my inkling is that he's confusing citations for publications. Machia Relli. Seho Anthropus. Shad Ensis. Let's see here. Roberto Machia Relli. Okay. Ro Dang it. What I wanted to do. Roberto Machiarelli, Sailing the Shadensis. Show results for that. Controversial femur. Could belong to ancient human relative. Accept all cookies. Oh, this is a freaking uh, pop side deal. Science Direct. If someone in the chat finds out before me, um, good. <laughs> Let's see, Robert Machiarelli. Um, view and Scopus? I don't know. I really want to bust one down and find out for sure. Ninety-four documents by the author. Yeah, that's not two hundred and eleven, Ramat. That's not two hundred and eleven at all. I don't know. This is so classic. This same thing happened to Rational Mind when when he was covering the barcoding thing. Like, Ramat don't, just doesn't say where he gets his sources from, so it's really difficult to actually track them down. But he's already wrong. 94 publications is certainly less than what we see from Guy at all, so if you really want to go out on that, well, you know, make those your stipulations. That's not super helpful for you. Yet again, Ramat roasted by his own... <laughs> Roasted by his own work. You know what? I think I know what we can do. Hold on. Google Scholar. Okay, let's see here. And we'll do Machia Relly. Hmm. Uh, say Hell Anthropus. Mm -hmm. um, yeah, it doesn't say how many citations it is. Well, shoot. I was hoping that that would be our answer, that it would be, like, cited by how many, how many people? I don't know. Let me check chat. Maybe chat is telling me. No, chat is being 
<laughs> rational mind. A diploma in zoo management is not the same as a degree in zoology. Yeah. Let's yeah. I listen, you're you're really gonna want to backstroke on this one, my dude. Standing for truth. You said you'd correct yourself as well. George Bond sent you the info on his completed degree. Nah, listen, I'm looking at his degree in zoo management. Listen, that is not, you're, you're digging the hole deeper because if you've got a degree in zoo management and you're proposing that that's a degree in zoology, that's being dishonest. So you're not making the case for Joseph any better. Plus what you, the, the dishonest part for you standing was you said he had a degree in uh, uh, paleobiology, geology, and paleontology or something along those lines. I'm, I'm paraphrasing, but yeah, you're, you're not getting out of this one. I'm going to remember this one for a long time because it's very, very, very funny to me. <clears throat> you're going to have to excuse me. My voice is also going. Um, so far, George Bond and Sandy Purdue have been presented zero evidence the guy has actual qualifications. They aren't smart enough to understand why the useless junk they've been shown is irrelevant. Sunflower, why is there even a zoo management program at any accredited university in the U.S.? That's my question. Maybe they just need really qualified zoo people. Also, welcome, Sunflower. Thank you for being here. Um, Kyle Saltzman, your channel is based. Keep it up. Best compliment all day. Thank you. Listen, we're here to drink tea and bust creationism and talk about monkey. That's what this channel is for. Hmm. Or two qualifications. Thank you, Rational Mind. Surprise, surprise from Henry Hansen. Yeah, true. Surprise, surprise. Okay, let's hop back in. Continue to look, go through what uh, Ramad is doing. The clear locket, yeah, this is from that same paper. Want to know how I know that that's from the same paper without even having to look it up? Because I read the paper on stream, you guys. I, I went through Machiarelli et al. and compared it with Guy et al. I looked at the two and I compared their work and I gave my opinion. Um, again, she lit, yeah, let's look at this. Evie, he even knows that. The main gist of what Erica said was, well, we may not know for sure about any of these missing links. We may not know for sure who's in the direct lineage. Yes, I've said that from square one, Ramat. Like, that's not a gotcha. You said this thing, and then me being like, yes, I did say that thing. That thing is true. That's not a gotcha, my guy. You got to work a little harder than that. What? Erica's always saying how these set in, how set in stone these hominin bones are, and that it is a part of the human family tree. Nope. No, 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 no. Being a part of the human family tree is not the same thing as being a part of the direct lineage. Let us add it to the list of things that Ramat doesn't know about. Let's just put that in the pile. Superb. Now all of a sudden her video is talking about this specific gorilla. No, it's also funny to me that he's on this gorilla thing because the anthropologist that I talked about or that I talked to noted that it's much more similar to a chimp than a gorilla. The, the femur is much more similar to uh, a chimp. Um, but yeah, you know, one pops eye argument. And it's the same thing. Um, it's clear her vendetta against why it's clear her vendetta is against YC at this point. Oh, I hate YC. Yeah, totally. I totally I wouldn't do this if I didn't dislike YC. I think it's horrible. Um, but you know, I, I want to be very clear about something too. This is something extra that I wanted to point out. Um, that I've wanted to point out before. Being mean about someone's opinions is not the same thing as disliking the person. Okay, you can you can roast the hell out of someone's like stance and be like, it's literally the dumbest piece of shit that I've ever heard in my life. And then you can be like, yeah, they're an okay person. You know, that's that's something that you can do. And most importantly, you can treat them with respect. But that respect has to be for me, it's default. For mo Some people say respect has to be earned. For me, it's a default thing. But Raw Mad and Staying for Truth have lost it actively. And you can go back in my history as far as you want. I, I try to be civil. I try to be kind. I try to be compassionate. And I try to understand the point of view that the other person is putting forward because I, I, ge I genuinely just want to know. That's it. I want to know where they're coming from. Um, one, because I want to be, I want to articulate a good argument against it um, or see if one can be composed. Uh, but, but the other is because they're just another person and I don't want to be mean to someone just because I think they're wrong on something. The reason I'm being a little bit of a bitch right now is because they have not given me that same respect. They've wasted my time actively, um, been dishonest multiple times, as you've seen in this very chat. Um, and because of that, I don't feel obligated to to be super nice anymore. Uh, I just don't. I, I feel that that mutual respect has been lost. Um, and so, you know, or never was there in the first place. It was a one way respect street. Um, me, I was, I was, I'm a real simp for mutual respect. Let's put it that way. 
Erica, St. Helenthropus Chinensis is not a missing link. It has now been falsified. Yeah, no, it hasn't. If you read <laughs> nothing but a gorilla for the third or fourth time by separate teams looking at different parts of the body, it's just insane to me. Like, taking separate pop sci articles isn't the same thing as separate studies. Like, Ramad is taking separate pop sci articles and he's being like, these, dis these, look, these tell us that it's just a gorilla femur. Um, but then the pop sci articles are talking about the same paper. Um, just usual, just business as usual. Look at this. The Guardian, beautiful. I don't know what this is. Oh, this is a 2020. That's the same paper. Awesome. More of these. It's talking about the same paper. Look, that's same phys.org paper. Yep. Awesome. And then pop sci articles. Uh, super, super embarrassing, honestly. Like this, this is... Uh, this is probably one of the worst things I've seen come out of the channel because this was proposed not as a joke or not as something that was unfinished. This was proposed to me as a legitimate full rebuttal by standing for truth. So real bad job there, boys. Since 2006, the state of hasn't advanced out all that much. No additional fossils have been discovered. Do not humans live in populations? Yet here's a single fossil find that they want us to believe existed as a transitional species for millions of years with no other evidence at all. Total nonsense, but that's what you get with fossils. Low confidence, inference, conjecture, and storytelling with that end. But these guys are super cool with having single specimens of dinosaurs and being okay with that being proposed as like as a, as a type specimen, right? So the, the double standard is is shocking to me, but yeah, living living populations is something that social primates do, but that doesn't mean you're going to get multiple representations. Many dinosaurs were very social, um, but we have specific members of specific groups that are part of social genera or social um, kind of taxa, but we only have one representative of them. Also, it's not that easy to fossilize in, in the environments that these guys were living in, these, these deciduous woodlands. Okay, all right, home stretch, baby. We're almost there. So g give me your energy chat. Give me, uh, throw your energy my way. Um, I, I definitely need it. Then Erica says, well, orangutans have 12 ribs. And just as predicted yet again by YECs, they hunt for a single similar feature just so they can prove relation and its gospel truth to them now. Just as expected, though, they do it all the time till it refutes them and then invoke convergent evolution for that scenario. Um, no, th the thing is, ribs are somewhat plastic like the rib number is somewhat plastic and it's just a, a similar thing happened in orangutans that happened in humans uh that's not all that shocking the interesting thing is because chimpanzees are mostly quadrupedal and so are gorillas it's not very surprising that since orangs are um they don't really do a clamoring they do kind of a a, a, a bipedal locomotion mostly it's uh brachiation right so they keep their body more upright than gorillas and chimps do and boy, that, that sure seems to match the other hominoid that keeps its body really upright, humans. So this upright position and a selection for 12 instead of 13 ribs seems to have a pattern, doesn't it? Wow, that's really shocking. I know everyone is just as gobsmacked as me, um, but you know, I don't know. I don't even have like my, it's not worth the ATP in my cells to like do a jaw drop at this point because it's just business as usual. Um, yeah, so so the idea is that these guys wanted to make rib count, sorry, Ramat wanted to make rib count this differentiating point between humans and the other apes, but then he's like, got a problem, right? Because orangutans have 12 ribs. That's the point, Ramat, is that you can't use it as a differentiating factor if two of the three, or sorry, two of the four have 12 and two of the four have 13. Um, it doesn't work. So Erica tries to make the case all the time, or the argument that the brain case size is sometimes found larger in primates as well. She lists all the names that we YC say are homo sapiens and not apes. Of course, she throws in the smorgasbord bones of homo habilis. And yeah, you're SOL um, with the homo habilis stuff. I've heard nothing with response to over six hours of content explaining why these are legitimate species. You haven't touched Rudolfensis or Gautengensis, just a single skull of homo habilis instead of the multiple skulls that we have of it, multiple post crania that we have of homo habilis and of Gautengensis and of uh, Rudolfensis. But no, to you, there's only one. Just like to creationist, Lucy is the only Australopithecine. Um, they, they don't even consider Africanus or Afarensis, by the way. Uh, but they, despite, you know, notwithstanding all of the Australopithecus Afarensis we have, they don't even consider the other Australopithecines or Sediba for that matter. So yet again, this doesn't work. Um, and then he shows a bunch of pictures, again, that don't really matter. Um, like these, these are just pictures of members of genus Homo and showing like the 
variation than we have in genus Homo. Boy, it's a shame we don't see any chins there, isn't it, Ramat? Look at all those chins. <laughs> all right. We'll touch on more icing on the cake, but let's check in with the chat. Because I do like to check in with the chat. Okay. We'll, we'll scroll up a little bit. Ooh, we got a lot of ads at me. Good good stuff. All right. Let's see. The na the Nature and Relationships Sale and should send this. Yeah. No citations yet. Awesome. So Machiarelli has no citations for his work on uh, Sale and Chidensis. I suspect we'll get a comments on it, too. Ray Ray creationists have warped imaginations in education, but gives us a good look into creationist desperation for authority. Yeah, that's true, too. Um, let's see. Stating for truth, he has a degree in paleobiology. Get over it. Then produce the degree. That's all That's all you have to do. Uh, Smitty, what do you think of Seigart's position on theistic evolution or whatever? And would you have a debate with him where both sides are sane? I think so. I really like Seigart. And I think that he he's coming from a position of... Sai is a respected scientist. He he's done work in the field or in in the lab. He's done legitimate work. He knows what he does really really well. Um, and he is very compelled. He finds the 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 complexity of small things very compelling. So for Sai, at least from the conversations that I've had from him, he's kind of a fine tuning for abiogenesis kind of guy. Um, and then evolution as a mechanism from there. I don't really have any particularly strong position on abiogenesis. I think that we've got some really awesome support for it. Uh, but if someone was a fine tuner and like someone or something fine tuned the conditions for that, I don't really care. Um, for me, I study evolution um, and whether or not someone fine tuned the conditions for abiogenesis, again, specifying that I don't think someone did, but whether they did or not, doesn't change the fact that humans are apes and the earth is ancient um, and that evolution is a thing. And Sai and I can agree on all of those things. So I don't really think we'd have anything to debate about other than, than a bio. Um, and basically I would be like, I find these cases compelling. And he would be like, I don't. And that would be the long and short of it. Um, so, but I like Sai. I think he's awesome. Intrigued feline. Tweet another picture of the teeth. This one's better in comparative. Ooh, okay. I'm going to check that out. Uh, but not about shit. Okay. Sorry. Oops. Mm. Mm -hmm -hmm. Oh yeah. Dapper. They do get dinosaurs badly wrong. Faux show. Ugly German truths. Is Raw Matt in here or does Gutsy Gibbon speak to him theoretically? Yeah, I don't think Raw Matt watches my videos. I think that he experiences them uh, vicariously through Standing for Truth, who barely watches them. Um, Kyle Saltzman, unrelated question to the stream, but do you watch Vosh? I, I do. I enjoy Vosh's content. I do. Um, I, I, uh, I've I been watching Vosh, I think, since he had like, I'm going to hipster the shit out of you guys right now, since he had like 30,000 subs. Um, I kind of stumbled across them. I like the bread tubers a lot. I guess Standing for Truth would call me a communist, but I I honestly don't really give a shit about that. Let's see. Importantly, Sai doesn't claim that ID or buy it or ABAO is absolutely necessary. He just views it as more probable in his opinion, which is fine. Yeah, absolutely. Oh, I I 100 percent agree, CRISPR. Yeah, that's that's the thing. I don't think I'd have anything to argue with Sai about. He was a great debate partner. Um, I I had a chat with him beforehand, and he's just a really cool guy. Yes, like, I remember you had a convo with Sal Cordova in phylogenetics, and he was pretty good, but then on a solo hangout, he was like, phylogenetics is all nonsense. What the hell? <sighs> yeah, dude. I don't know about that. I, I saw that, too. I kind of found that really weird. Um, Sal's kind of the kind... He's the kind of guy that, like, can be convinced of things if you can show support for it, so... And I've asked him before, like, how do you cope with the, like, because he, he's, you know, said before on air that, like, yeah, chimp and human proteins are, like, identical, obviously, because the, the coding base pairs are pretty, pretty identical, right? Because we, we share 98.8% of them. Uh, but, yeah, I, I don't, his, his, his answer to that almost seemed like, and I hope I'm not stronging him here, this is speculation. I think Sal thinks that chimps were created very close to humans intentionally to be used for finding medicines to help humans, to be a model organism, essentially. Um, so if Sal sees this, he can correct me if I'm wrong. That's from, from my talks with him, that's what I gathered. Um, let's see, Mr. Wilford, I have an AA in general science, part of my transfer requirement. I took several geology courses for it. I also have a certification for CPR and emergency respiration. Does that mean I have a distinct geology degree and paramedic certifications? According to Standing for Truth, yes. So congratulations, you are both... Um, Actually, I would say you're both a doctor and a geologist. Um, so that's like, what is that? A double doctor? A double doc? Um, Nestle, I'm, oh, okay, we already covered that. Yeah, fellow comrade meeting is next week. Um, 
I think I missed something. I discovered Bosch last couple of weeks via Destiny. Yeah, I enjoy them both too, Rational Mind. I think they both have good takes. Um, and Kyle Saltzman, Bosch saved me from the alt-right. I really like his content. I do too. I think that he's, uh, I really like how he sources everything. That's like what I really like the most about him. He'll say something and then I'll be like, here's a paper that I think supports me. Um, which is like very, a, a good sourcing mindset. Nestle like, chimps as model organisms for finding medicine. It seems like a roundabout way of doing this. Why not create humans to be immune to disease? Ah, that's a great question. <laughs> that's a really great quest. Great question. I don't know. Uh, Ray Road, according to SFT, I have 10 degrees in the way I spent too, uh, too much time at school. Yeah, same. Yeah, I've got like a million degrees too, dude. Yeah, by uh, by standings criteria, we're, we're all rolling in degrees. Um, yeah, put up or shut up with those degrees standing. We've yet to see them. Okay, let's see. Let's continue. Okay, more icing on the cake. I think this is our last section. Thank God. Neanderthal were both neurologically and anatomically able to produce language by having a high, having a hyoid bone in both Fox P2 genes. No, no. But we think they may have been able to produce something similar to language, but having two Fox P2 genes, as you point out later in this very article, where injecting a putting a Fox P2 gene into an orangutan doesn't result in language, does not equate to using language. Having a hyoid bone is equally absurd and tells me you don't know what a hyoid bone is because Siamangs have hyoid bones. They have big ass hyoid bones to make those big swelly throat sacs. Wrong again, put it on the list. The hyoid bone is located in the throat directly related to the structure of human vocal tract indistinguishable from that of modern humans. Um, no, it's actually not indistinguishable. In fact, there's a very hilarious video you can find online uh, that uses the shape of the hyoid bone to uh, guesstimate what a Neanderthal would have sounded like. They actually do this whole um, uh, speculative vocal track. It's a really cool video. I I'll try to plug it in the description. Uh, but no, uh, but I do like that you indistinguishable from modern humans. First of all, that's false. Second of all, it's also false because you cited a freaking 1987 paper when there's been work on this done this year. Uh, then they discovered Neanderthal had two Fox P2 genes and modern day humans have associated with language. Yeah, that's that's fine. Evolutionists assume that man split from ape is the reason we know how to speak is because of... Evolutionists like Erica assume that man split from ape and the reason we now speak and have language is because we have the Fox P2 gene. No, that's one of the reasons, but not the only reason. If this is true, then for the most part, activating both Fox P2 genes and tweaking only two tiny changes in the sequence uh, should easily give most primates the ability to speak since we know that anatomically speaking, they can. This is a fun one. So this is a... Uh, wrong and stupid statement. I realize I've said that a lot, but I'm going to keep saying it because Ramat cannot help himself from saying dumb, stupid things. Um, whether he is dumb and stupid, I can't say. Um, I have an inkling, but he's certainly saying a lot of dumb and stupid things. Sorry if I called you an idiot or a moron earlier, Ramat. I can't prove that you are, but I can prove that you're acting like one. Um, yeah, so I pulled up this paper from 2015, and the funny thing is there's more recent work on it. Uh, that's that's the coolest part about getting engaged in science uh, is that you can look at the new work on it. So this is from Philip Lieberman. Uh, and if you know anything about Lieberman, you know that he works a lot on language and the evolution of language. Um, comment on monkey vocal tracks are speech ready. So this is the most recent work on this, uh, on this paper from July of 2017. Monkey vocal tracks are capable of producing monkey speech, not the full range of articulate human speech. The evolution of human speech entailed both anatomy and brains. Fitch, Deboer, uh, Mather, and Gazanfar, Gazanfar, Insights Advances, claim that monkey vocal tracts are speech ready and conclude that the evolution of human speech capabilities required neural changes rather than modifications of vocal anatomy. Neither premise is consistent either with the data presented and the conclusions reached by Deboer and Fitch themselves in their own published papers on the role of anatomy in the evolution of human speech or with the body of independent studies published since the 1950s. Um, so saw it off with that, Ramat, and know the literature better. You don't have an excuse here. This is just bad, bad work. Um, so no, inserting a Fox P2 gene would not leave us expectant that other primates could speak. Not in the slightest. Um, and I've gone through this ad nauseum on this channel, but the evolution of language is a really interesting thing, because in one of the dumber um, Circopithecids, the gelatas, we find that their vocalizations follow human linguistic laws. This was a study that actually one of my uh, program advisors was involved in. And moreover, um, we see that Campbell's monkeys use grammar and syntax in their calls. They have calls that can be specified with suffixes, which is very interesting. And humans, um, human babies, human toddlers from the age of, I think it's at like three, three and four, it's either two and three or three and four. And uh, chimpanzees share 96% of their gestural repertoire, which is 
curious no um yeah the evolution of language is like pretty decently like understood that that track is is at least visualized right there's a ton of work to be done on it i'm not saying that there isn't but yeah this is not an irreducibly complex thing in the slightest yeah so he talks about adding fox p2 genes um it, again i've explained why this doesn't matter um it, it's just the the silliest thing the premise doesn't match so you know you can kind of it's a non sequitur um blah 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 god taught adam yeah cool um citation needed he cites genesis <laughs> um this study also lends weight to the idea that language didn't evolve from scratch no one thinks language evolved from scratch um language evolved from pre-existing vocalizations but ronat doesn't know what that means so instead he thinks that this is some kind of id thing no one over the age of 13 can ever learn language. yeah it's a developmental thing which is interesting um so why are we why are we trying to teach adult primates to do it which is kind of neat it'd be very interesting to see what we get when we teach sign language or like lexigram work from baby like infants infant primates like uh, bonobos or chimps upward okay let's see um yeah now he talks about how uh this is very funny i remember seeing this fox p2 was found to be functionally different in humans compared to chimps yes it is functionally different w why would you expect otherwise the fox p2 gene is like for humans it, it does something completely different not only that the gene is protected from change so they had to come up with a rescuing device to say maybe it was under strong purifying selection highly constrained does not mean protected from change that's all i have to say about that just a, yet another thing that ramat does not understand so the gene is highly conserved and protected from change. Just appreciate the beauty that is this sentence. And what makes evolutionists things think it not only changed multiple times, but then underwent duplication and mutations uh, that changed it and didn't cause any harm. Uh, when that is all we see happening today, when studies are done. Nope. Again, the premise doesn't follow. Like this is this is this is why you go to school for this stuff, right? I mean, it, it's not because this stuff isn't um, intuitive. Right, like this is this is actually no shade on Ramat. It's shade on the fact, like as an in individual intelligent person, um, or as an individual who may or may not be intelligent. But education is important because it teaches you how to interpret studies. It teaches you how to understand premises. It teaches you how to understand what analyses work and what don't. Um, and it's important. But that's why Ramat doesn't have any education. Sadly, Erica sec Erica secular education has either gone to her head as gospel truth and she can no longer even consider an alternative but my suspicion is she has a vendetta and personal agenda for why she hates christian yc and it's not about the science at all just like arnron bill ludlow who had ulterior motives um no i hate yc i hate christian or yc no more than i hate any other yc um but there just aren't that many islamic ycs anymore and jewish people aren't well, you see either they don't tend to be YC. Um, it's all like the Christian YCs that are doing the big organizations and shit like that, which is why I cover them. But this is beautiful. Um, first, you get like this MS paint job where Erica is like poorly put onto the dress. Like you could have just, why isn't it centered? You know, Mendel's accountant. This is hilarious. Um, and I'm, I don't even know that I've got the breath to laugh at it because I'm so exhausted by this garbage uh, document. But let us consider evidence for yc a lot of this is cribbed from me as evidence against yc and they're just putting it in there as evidence for yc with absolutely no context coral growth rates magnetic decay rates continental erosion rates what is biological evidence genetic evidence geological evidence linguistic evidence this is just recombination rates migration evidence racemization rates you don't want to touch the racemization we'll, we'll be covering that eventually because that's just that shit crazy too underground oil pressure i don't know what are you, what are you even trying to say with that dude like we've we've covered the uh why you really don't want to be looking to the oil industry to help your case um basin modeling just btfos young earth creationism in one fell swoop um, and I happen to know this because, again, my, my, my fiance's brother, who's actually here um, at my house right now and is why I'm filming here and not in my usual setting, um, drills for oil. Uh, and he had the wherewithal to know that he was drilling in a Permian Basin. Hmm. Now, why would you know, why would knowing you're drilling in a Permian Basin or seeking out a Permian Basin be important? Because basin modeling helps you tell where the oil is. And basin modeling relies on, ta-da, radiometric dating. Oh, uh, the dendrochronology does not help you. Thermoluminescence dating. I don't think if we asked Ramat what is thermoluminescence dating, I don't think he could tell you. 
Um, that's how I know that this was cribbed from my list of things that are problematic for creationists. So um, yeah, the majority of these um, alone preclude young earth creationism from the mutation rates to the coral growth rates, magnetic decay, continental erosion, biological, genetic, geological, and linguistic evidence, uh, your migration evidence, that doesn't help you. Racinization rates hurts you. Um, few fixed substitutions, I've covered that already. Um, underground oil pressure, I don't know what he's trying to say there. If that's like from that Harima or McQueen shit that I saw, you don't want that, That's that hurts you too. Um, and opens up the whole oil industry as problematic as a conversation piece. Helium diffusion doesn't help you covered it. Though I don't know what one maternal and paternal line is meant to mean. I think that's supposed to be like, we come from a single pair that that is not supported. Um, I mean, you can have like a mitochondrial Eve, right? Like the last common ancestor of all, the last common female ancestor of all people. And that is not, don't mistake the colloquialisms for, for what it actually is. Speciation rate evidence, dendrochronology evidence, uh, that none of that helps. Anyways, that's the summary of, um, of Raw Matt's document, the one that I was presented by a legitimate rebuttal. So here's the funny thing, gang. This is the document that I woke up to this morning. I hope everyone's paying good attention because we have a lot of additional information that was added, mostly to the end. Um, curiously, he didn't seem to edit much of what he knew I was going to come after because he knew, I guess he knew that would be too obvious, but he adds a lot of stuff here at the end where he tries to answer um, all of the questions. And we're going to be covering this tomorrow or the next day um, because again, there's a lot to cover. Um, and make fun of here because they're boy howdy. This is what I wanted a rational mind to see. We've got a lot on DNA barcoding, uh, which is hilarious since probably one of the worst smackdowns I've ever seen on YouTube was what rational mind did on Jackson Wheat's channel. I'll include the link in the description for raw mats. Um, oh God, what would you even call it? I've used the word miscarriage too many times already. Um, a mass extinction of an attempt uh, for, for, barcoding as a means to delineate kinds. I have a PowerPoint prepared for it right here, uh, but we will be going through that tomorrow because I'm losing my voice already. And we've been doing this for like two and a half hours, but boy, can I talk. So yeah, you talked about DNA barcoding. I've already read all this. It's going to be very funny to go over. Um, yeah, this <laughs> already answered ad nauseum shows a playlist the same with the same videos that were before my own videos that were not addressed in any subsequent videos, which is, again, very funny um, and very dishonest. This is the same situation with valid for Homo floresiensis. None of what was actually addressed in, in my coverage of Homo floresiensis is touched. None of the new literature. It's just, wait, let us just cling to this 2009 paper. Very funny, very embarrassing. But again, we're going to be going through all of this ad nauseum. I can't wait to see how he tries to uh, to fix our, our coverage of um, the late Tolly footprints, my coverage of the late Tolly footprints. But here is something that I really, really want to share with you, because this leads into the final thing that I'm going to say today uh, before I usher you over um, into the, the competent hands of uh, Dan Stern Cardinal, who runs Creation Myths, and David P. Neff, who's going to be uh, on tonight. Because I have, again, read this already. I read this this morning over a cup of coffee. Um, it, it's nauseating, but we will be, like I said, we'll covering it tomorrow. Convince you that Jensen is a legitimate researcher. Why are you convinced of nothing ever from what I can tell, but okay, ready? Message him on Facebook. He replies within days. Then challenge him on what he has challenged anyone to. Pick an animal, your choice, and guess its mutation rate. You use evolutionary theory, and he will use YC assumption. We'll see where the data leads. Good enough for you. If not, why? Isn't that the gold standard of science? Predictions. So allow me to cancel the screen sharing and move on over to where I can see the chat. Ladies and gentlemen, I've got a very special treat for you this evening. And by me, I mean, it's not actually me, Dan and David Neff are covering it. But please go over to their channel at eight o'clock tonight. Um, I believe it's eight, is it eight o'clock Eastern or I had it pulled up, shoot. Oh shoot, I had it pulled up, but I'll put it, I'll put the link in the description so you can, you guys can actually see it. Um, yes, Dapper, it is confirmed predictions, not predictions. It's the gold standard of science. Um, that's funny how they equate those, is it not? Oh, but that being said, go over to Creation Myths tonight and watch their coverage on some of Jensen's work because some new emails and communications have come to light that have gone to Jensen's sources and investigated what they think. Uh, and Jensen has also been consulted, which is going to be very, very fun. 
um, because it's going to be yet another reason why this guy is like a huckster and a snake oil salesman, Nathaniel Jensen is. Um, but it's going to be very funny too to see how Standing for Truth and the team react. It's not my field. I'm not a geneticist, uh, but you can certainly, we'll certainly see how they respond and how uh, how Dan is going to actually interact with with that whole deal. Why doesn't Jensen man up and show up? Yeah, why not? I maybe he'll show up tonight. I don't know. He was invited. Uh, Rue from the dot. I'm having a lot of fun. Thank you for the stream. Thank you for being here. I really appreciate it. Let me see. Let me make sure that I covered everything that I wanted to cover today. Um, I also want to plug Speed of Sound of Gravity. Um, you guys should go and subscribe to his channel. He actually moved his uh, weather report today so that uh, I could have you guys here. So go subscribe to him. Um, and let's see. The criteria. Yes. So here's the thing about this. This whole thing here where he's taking screenshots from my questions for my I'm probably done with creationist video. When you're answering the question, the, the equivalent to what's been done here to, to tell you ahead of time. Oh, I've realized I'm not screen sharing anymore. The equivalent of what has been done here is like if you're taking an essay, you're you're in middle school, right? Uh, life is good. You just got Ruby and Sapphire, Ruby or Sapphire on your Game Boy Color or sorry, on your Game Boy Advance. Uh, you're trading with your buddies. Uh, Pogs are out, but Beyblades are in. So life is fun. Things are going well. Nick has excellent programming and so does Cartoon Network. Disney is doing pretty well too, even though they're doing that live action block. Um, but the, it's good. You're in middle school. It's fine. You've got no responsibilities. Um, and you're sitting in, in class and you're handed a test, right? And this test essentially is like uh, a history test. It's a classic history test. And the first question is, um, <laughs> the first question is, who was the first president of the United States? Explain some of his accomplishments and why they were important to the United States of America today, why they are relevant today. The equivalent of what Raw Matt and Staying for Truth has done is look at that question and say, the first president of the United States was George Washington. Full stop, that's it. Cut print, that's a wrap. Checkmate, evil tards, and moved on. That's not answering the question, and you wouldn't get full credit on that question on the exam. Saying that you've answered the question when you've given a half-assed answer that's been said before isn't an answer. And standing very goofily, I would say, said to me in, 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 a, previous, uh, in a previous comment section, in that comment section I linked earlier, uh, who am I to state the stipulations? I'm the other person in the conversation. In this two-way street, I set the stipulations for what your ans what, what is sufficient in your answers, uh, especially since I asked the question. So yes, that's how a conversation works. And in, in turn, you get to say what the stipulations for a, a uh, let's see, what's the word I'm looking for, for a, um, a fully fledged answer would be. That's how this works. So let me make sure. Yeah, I think that's it. Uh, yeah, so the criteria for a question, I, I'm gonna let Raw Matt take that in mind. Um, and, and for instance, one of the things that I said um, in discussing this with Standing for Truth, for instance, is when I say Noah's Ark needs to account for the mass extinctions, Saying Noah's Ark was crazy and could account for the mass extinctions isn't sufficient. What would what would be a sufficient answer would be to go through the five mass extinctions um, from you know the the Ordovician, uh, the Devonian, the Permian, um, the Triassic, and the Cretaceous, Jurassic Cretaceous would be to go through those five mass extinctions and explain geochemically how Noah's Ark can account for those and how it can account for those in sequence. That's how you answer the question. That's the sufficient answer to that question. Um, and short of that, it's not an answer. I'm sorry. Um, I give you the respect of going in detail into your questions and bringing out the sources and doing all of that. Um, but you won't give me that mutual respect. So you're not worth my time anymore. Um, long and short of it. So, you know, we've got 90 people here and uh, I can't believe we, we kept everyone here for this long. Thank you so much. Um, let me see. I think that's it. Yeah, come back tomorrow if you if you enjoyed this. First, like, comment, and subscribe. Uh, and second of all, do come back tomorrow because we will be going through Ramat's much longer second half of this uh, um, atrocity that he very quickly edited in uh, what can only be defined as a big wah wah crying baby kind of way. Um, so, my gentle and modern apes, please have a safe rest of your day, have a tea, relax, uh, and don't forget to catch uh, Creation Myths interview with Jensen later today. It's going to be a real good one, folks. Um, and with that, I'm going to end the broadcast. I really hope I didn't forget anything.